Hello. How y'all doing? There's always like a brief moment where I'm trying to figure out if the microphone is muted or not. Uh, let me organize that just a little bit. No one fucking cares except me, but. I like to give the appearance that I have my life together. I suppose that's unfair to me. I, I lately I've been I've been doing well. Uh, I I'm strangely uh what's the word? I don't I don't know. I'm worried about how well put together I am despite the quarantine, I guess. I like not interacting with people and I'm doing quite well under under this. Um, I'm super productive. I've fucked up my sleep schedule on purpose this time because unfucking it was bad. Um, I don't know, I've been writing a lot and doing a lot of creative shit and it's been going well uh so there's that i guess i'm just meant to to thrive under this these these conditions of don't leave your house hey arlette how you doing oh khaleesi what are you doing hi she's here hello khaleesi's been very nice which is great, because, you know, usually she's, if you stick your tail in my coffee, I'm going to be very upset. Thank you. <laughs> it's not for you, and you'll be upset too, because your tail will be wet. Uh... <laughs> oh, what's the time? Right now it is, uh... Hell yeah, Egglag, thank you so much for the sub, really appreciate it. Drop it in the cup. Hell yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's 9.39 p.m. right now, so I went to bed at, like, 8 a.m., and then, uh, oh, hello, that's your, that's your butt, I don't want to see it, I don't want to see your butt, can we put it down, thank you, <laughs> cats love just showing their buttholes to everyone, absolutely everyone, um, yeah, there's some little Khaleesi heads, Khaleesi, that's you. Yeah, it's you. It's your face. It's right there. And it's also here. Um, yeah, it's like it's 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 around 10 p.m. right now. I went to bed at 8 a.m. and woke up around 2 p.m., stayed up for a bit, got a little work done, and then I took a nap for an hour before the stream. Because uh, I've noticed that I'm much better at reading once I've le if 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 I've taken a nap right beforehand. That is that is peak condition. Hello, yeah. Uh, she's um, you know, she has some anxiety, so sometimes she'll like, Khaleesi, I don't want to see your butt, please. <laughs> Very mad that I don't want to see her butt. Um, oh God, what was I even saying? Uh, oh, usually she she can get a little moody, and I'm not sure why. I think it's just her anxiety, where she'll just out of nowhere just bite me, like my leg or something. Like I'll just be walking by, and she'll just go wow. And I'm the only person that she has ever done this to, which is very weird. Like anyone else, no, th this is it's literally only happened to me. And um. She always feels really bad afterwards, I can tell, because she's a very emotionally mature cat, and I can I can tell, like, she will go out of her way to, like, saunter up to me, like, very, like, low to the ground, like, hey, I'm sorry, like, her body language is very sad, and she'll just, like, crawl up into my lap and just sit there, like, as an apology, um, and so she feels really bad afterwards, so I don't think she means to do it, I think... She just has a hormone imbalance or something. That's that's what um, a lot of cat experts that I've been talking to have said. Uh, but lately, she hasn't been doing that. She's she's had a very different attitude the past two days, 
where she's been very, very sweet and like lets me pet her all I want and and doesn't get moody with me if if she's not fed on time. Like usually if it's like five minutes until she's supposed to eat, she'll get like very cranky. Uh, but she hasn't been doing that and I love it. I hope it stays this way. Don't know why. Might be the weather. She's been lounging about a bit. Well, last stream was interesting enough that I stayed up for this one, almost 4 a.m. here. Holy shit, well, the hell yeah. Uh, thank you for joining us. <laughs> That's dope that uh, you weren't even here for the beginning, and you're just like, mm, this, this sounds interesting, I want to stick around for this book. That's awesome. Well, um, good morning. <laughs> Usually for these streams, uh, I play some, since you're a little new, uh, usually I will play music for like the first 10 minutes or so while I file about and like get my coffee ready and shit and just like get ready to sit down and it allows people to filter in and then we'll sit around powwow for a couple minutes, maybe usually it's like 10 to 15 minutes and then I start reading the book. But, uh, people aren't super chatty, so maybe I'll just go into the book, you know, if, if, if that's what we're looking forward to. Uh, let me just grab a tissue real quick. <clears throat> I got some, what is it? Is it THC or CBD? What's the one that calms you down? I got some gummies of that. Uh, I'm not eating them right now or anything. I just, I just received them today. Um, I also have the fan on, is that, uh, yeah, when I don't talk, it's not getting picked up, so I think I put the filter on a high enough level of noise removal that you can't even hear it. Let me just scarf down as much coffee as I can. Khaleesi. Khaleesi, can you stop? Khaleesi, I hate when you do that. She's burying something, but she's not burying anything. She's just patting at the floor with her paws. She thinks that she's burying things. Ah. All right. Oh, hell yeah. Let's do it. <clears throat> Where were we? Ah, yes. The I forget what that quote is from the from the Princess Bride, where he's reading a book and then he he comes back and he's like, "Where were we?" Ah, yes, the the terrible dungeon or whatever the fuck it is. But here we go. Let's do it. All right, we're starting on an Amy chapter. Because I thought that would be fun. I heard her. I heard her do it again. She's not gonna do it. Thank you. Hi. All right. <clears throat> Amy Elliot Dunn, seven days gone. I'm pregnant. Thank you, Noel Hawthorne. The world knows it now, you little idiot. In the day since she pulled her stunt at my vigil, I do wish she hadn't upstaged my vigil, though. Ugly girls can be such thunder stealers. The hatred against Nick has ballooned. I wonder if he can breathe with all that fury building around him. I knew the key to a big time coverage, round the clock, frantic, bloodlust, never ending Ellen Abbott coverage would be the pregnancy. Amazing Amy is tempting as is. Amazing Amy knocked up is irresistible. Americans like what is easy, and it's easy to like pregnant women. They're like ducklings or bunnies or dogs. Still, it baffles. I'm sorry. Still, it baffles me that these self-righteous, self-enthralled waddlers get such special treatment, as if it's so as if it's so hard to spread your legs and let a man ejaculate between them. You know what is hard? Faking a pregnancy. Pay attention because this is impressive. It started with my vacant-brained friend Noel. The Midwest is full of these types of people. The nice enoughs. 
Nice enough, but with a soul made of plastic, easy to mold, easy to wipe down. The woman's entire music collection is formed from Pottery Barn compilations. Her bookshelves are stocked with coffee table crap, the Irish in America, Museum of Football, a history in pictures, we remember 9-11, something dumb with kittens. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good, I love that, something dumb with kittens. <laughs> I knew, I knew I needed a pliant friend for my plan, someone I could load up with awful stories about Nick, someone who would become overly attached to me, someone who'd be easy to manipulate, who wouldn't think too hard about anything I said because she felt privileged to hear it. Noelle was the obvious choice. And when she told me she was pregnant again, triplets weren't enough, apparently, I realized I could be pregnant too. A search online. How to drain your toilet for repair. Noelle invited for lemonade. Lots of lemonade. Noelle peeing in my drained, unflushable toilet, each of us so terribly embarrassed. Me, a small glass jar. The pee in my toilet going into the glass jar. Me, a well-laid history of needle-slash-blood phobia. Me, the jar, the glass jar of pee hidden in my purse, a doctor's appointment. Oh, I can't do a blood test. I have a total phobia of needles. Urine test. That'll do fine. Thank you. Me, a pregnancy on my medical record. Me, running to Noel with the good news. Perfect. Nick gets another motive. I get to be sweet, missing, pregnant lady. My parents suffer even more. Ellen Abbott can't resist. Honestly, it was thrilling to be selected, finally, officially, for Ellen, among all the hundreds of other cases. It's sort of like a talent competition. You do the best you can, and then it's out of your hands. It's up to the judges. And oh, does she hate Nick and love me. I wish my parents were getting such special treatment, though. I watched them on the news coverage, my mom, thin and reedy, the cords in her neck like spindly tree branches, always flexed. I see my dad grown ruddy with fear, the eyes a little too wide, the smile squared. He's a handsome man, usually, but he's beginning to look like a caricature, a possessed clown doll. I know I should feel sorry for them, but I don't. I've never been more than the, uh, I've never been more to them than a symbol anyway, the walking ideal, amazing Amy in the flesh. Don't screw up, you are amazing Amy, our only one. There is an unfair responsibility that comes with being an only child. You grow up knowing you aren't allowed to disappoint. You're not even allowed to die. There isn't a replacement toddling around. You're it. It makes you desperate to be flawless. And it also makes you drunk with the power. In such ways are despots made. <laughs> Amy is fucking light Yagami. Levels of villainous. Yeah, this is, um, it's real fucking deep i um <laughs> damn oh shit amy figured out how to harvest gamer gamer girl pee we did it we did it <laughs> we can do it we should bottle it um yeah this part in the movie is great because uh you can just see how much more blatantly evil amy is like the gene the evil genius is like really strong in the book because you can hear her thoughts um but in the one part of the movie where you can still hear amy's thoughts she's talking about the pee and the how she drained the toilet uh and she she just keeps calling noelle an idiot because in here she's really mean to noelle uh and in the movie she's not at nearly as mean because you just you got to keep moving uh, but she does call her an idiot. She's like, invite pregnant, uh, friend, local idiot. Invite pregnant idiot to your house. Like, she keeps calling Noelle an idiot. But in this, it's, like, very blatant. Yeah, I know my OneDrive is full. Leave me alone. <laughs> uh, let's see. This morning, I stroll over to Dorothy's office to get a soda. It's a tiny, wood-paneled room. The desk seems to have no purpose other than holding Dorothy's collection of snow globes from places that seem unworthy of commemoration. 
Gulf Shores, Alabama, Hilo, Arkansas. When I see the snow globes, I don't see paradise. I see overheated hillbillies with sunburns, tugging along wailing clumsy children, smacking them with one hand, with the other clutching giant non-biodegradable styrofoam cups of warm corn syrupy drinks. And this is interesting. Who is Dorothy? I think Dorothy might be the person... Um, Oh, I see, yeah. I think Dorothy is one of the people, or the person that she pays rent to, to stay at the place that she's at currently. Dorothy has one of those 70s kittens in a tree posters. Hang in there. She posts her poster... <laughs> she posts her poster with all sincerity. I like to picture her running into some self-impressed Williamsburg bitch, all Betty Page bangs and pointy glasses, who owns the same poster, ironically. I'd like to listen to them try to negotiate each other. Ironic people always dissolve when confronted with earnestness. It's their kryptonite. That's very, yeah, that's very true. <laughs> Dorothy has another gem taped to the wall by the soda machine, showing a toddler asleep on the toilet. Too tired to tinkle. I've been thinking about stealing this one, a fingernail under the old yellow tape while I distract chat with, with Dorothy. I bet I could get some decent cash for it on eBay. I'd like to keep some cash coming in, but I can't do it because that would create an electronic trail, and I've read plenty about those from my myriad true crime books. Electronic trails are bad. Don't use a cell phone that's registered to you because the cell towers can ping your location. Don't use your ATM or credit card. Use only public computers, well-trafficked. Beware of the number of cameras that can be on any given street, especially near a bank or a busy intersection or bodegas. Not that there are any bodegas down here. There are no cameras either in our cabin complex. I know. I asked Dorothy, pretending it was a safety issue. Actually, I'm going to write down something because that reminds me of a thing. Aha, there we go. Not even for my video, it's for a thing that I'm writing, actually. <clears throat> uh, so she was just talking about the, the video cameras. Uh, our clients aren't exactly big brother types, she said. Not that they're criminals, but they, don't uh, but they don't usually like to be on the radar. No, they don't seem like they'd appreciate that. There's my friend Jeff, who keeps his odd hours and returns with suspicious amounts of undocumented fish that he stores in massive ice chests. He is literally fishy. At the far cabin is a couple who are probably in their 40s, but meth-weathered, so they look at least 60. They stay inside most of the time, aside from occasional wild-eyed wild treks to the laundry room, darting across the gravel parking lot with their clothes and trash bags, some sort of tweaky spring cleaning. Hello, hello, they say, always twice with two head nods, then continue on their way. The man sometimes has a boa constrictor wrapped around his neck, though the snake is never acknowledged by me or him. In addition to these regulars, a goodly amount of single women straggle through, usually with bruises. Some seem embarrassed, others horribly sad. One moved in yesterday, a blonde girl, very young, with brown eyes and a split lip. She sat on her front porch, the cabin next to mine, smoking a cigarette, and when we caught each other's eyes, she sat up, straight, proud, her chin jutted out, no apology in her. I thought, I need to be like her. I will make a study of her. She is who I can be for a bit. The abused tough girl hiding out until the storm passes over. After a few hours of morning TV, scanning for any news on the Amy Elliott Dunn case, I slip into my clammy bikini. I'll go to the pool. Float a bit, take a vacation from my harpy brain. The pregnancy news was gratifying, but there is still so much I don't know. I planned so hard, but there are things beyond my control, spoiling my vision of how this should go. Andy hasn't done her part. The diary may need some help being found. The police haven't made a move to arrest Nick. I don't know what they've dis uh, I don't know what they've all discovered, and I don't like it. I'm tempted to make a call, a tip line call, to nudge them in the right direction. I'll wait a few more days. I have a calendar on my wall. 
and I mark three days from now with the words, Call today. So I know that's how long I've agreed to wait. Once they find the diary, things will move quickly. Oh, cool. So they're finally bringing up the, uh, the calendar. In the movie, Amy has this calendar that she has marked, you know, with, like, little stickies that's, like, kill self today or uh, this and this and this. And that's one of them. Oh, Dorothy, you're so unbelievably cringe. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I, I appreciate Dorothy. I, <laughs> there are just some people, you know, like that, where they, they own something unironically and you're like, oh, bless you. I see that more as like, uh, what's the word? Wholesome, I guess. I guess I see it as wholesome. <laughs> Let's see. Outside, it's jungle hot once again. The cicada's closing in. <laughs> oh, hell yeah! Egglag, thank you for the bits, for the 420 bits. <laughs> Very specific. Love it. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, 420 is coming up, huh? Like, actual 420. Um,. It's uh, crazy to think that last year we were like, oh man, next year, you know, it's going to be 420, but like the whole, yeah, like the whole month is going to be 420. Uh, it's going to be fucking lit. We're all going to get so high. And now looking at where we are right now, it's like, oh no, <laughs> we, we can't go out and like actually celebrate 420. But there's going to be a lot of high people hanging out in their houses this year. whole month is 420 so you gotta you gotta smoke weed every day just like just like uh, Saint Snoop Dogg says the high of isolation is the greatest high I agree <laughs> you know I've been I've been thriving living in in isolation I love not having to deal with people I'm legit getting a high from just <laughs> I'm just barricading inside my house Outside, it's jungle hot once again. The cicada's closing in. My inflatable raft is pink with mermaids on it and too small for me. My calves dangle in the water. But it keeps me floating aimlessly for a good hour, which is something I've learned I like to do. That's interesting. I is in quotes, you know, because Amy is... Well, Amy is constantly becoming other people during the book. <laughs> Who's excited for the 420 Awards? Is there a 420 awards? Is it an awards for how high you can get? <laughs> Which sounds like a very funny ceremony that they're just like up there and they're like, congrats, you won. And they're just like fucking baked as shit and don't know what's happening. I do need to try my weed uh, gummies. I sound like such a fucking drug virgin when I say that don't I I'm just like <laughs> I gotta I got I do I do a weed there's something I don't know if I've talked about it on stream before but there's um a thing that my friends make fun of me for where um my friends and I have all lived lives but mine hasn't involved drugs as much as other people's I have friends who are uh you know um some friends have been homeless some friends were like coke addicts uh and they're like years years clean now but they've like seen some shit and they were like talking about stuff and i was in the room also and they were like jesse's probably horrified by some of this stuff and i'm like no come on guys i'm cool i'm with it i'm just, like i've done pot i've done pot like so, so many times I, i've done pot like six times and that's the thing that they make fun of me for uh because it's a very funny thing to say <laughs> I've done pot like six times. <laughs> That's so many times. <laughs> I'm I'm a hip. You know pot is a gateway drug, so I'll be just doing some coke after this, you know? <laughs> the 420 Awards is a cringy award show made by the creator of Cool Cat. Oh shit, I did not know that. Well, that sounds fun is it like ironic funny or is it like very cringy is it like 
supposed to not be ironic, so it's bad, or, um... Cause cool, cool Cat, I remember being cool. But maybe it wasn't? I don't know. Oh, and you know what? I should go through and see, um... If, uh, if anyone followed me that I didn't say hello to. Uh, yeah, just in case, if you're here. Uh, generally nervous, thank you for the follow. And 759 Silver, thank you all so much for the follow. Really appreciate it. Let's get some air horns in the chat. <laughs> thank you. Really appreciate it, buds. Uh, it's unironic. Oh, no. <laughs> that does sound bad. <laughs> But I'm very cool, as you can tell. Let's continue. <laughs> um, you know, what? I'm gonna write down that note that I said where Amy becomes she becomes uh, so many people during the course of the book that I think you know. Eventually, does she lose track of who she actually is? Or the real her rots, maybe. The real her... Let me write that down. She's so busy becoming other people. So busy becoming other people that uh, the real her slips into madness as a result because she's not doing maintenance on her actual self. <clears throat> I can see a blonde head bobbing across the parking lot, and then the girl with the split lip comes through the chain-link gate with one of the bath towels from the cabins, no bigger than a tea towel, and a pack of merits and a book and SPF 120. I think pack of merits uh, is probably a cigarette. It's, it's capitalized merits, so... Um... Oh, so that's funny. Okay, so she says, uh, and a pack of merits and a book and SPF 120. Lung cancer, but not skin. She settles herself and applies the lotion carefully, which is different from the other beat-up women who come here. They slather themselves in baby oil, leave greasy shadows on the lawn chairs. The girl nods to me, the nod men give each other when they sit down at a bar. She's reading The Martian Chronicles by Ray Bradbury. A sci-fi girl. Abused women like escapism, of course. Um, I'm trying to figure out if I want to give Amy um, an accent, because in the movie she gives herself like a light accent to kind of further delve into a new identity. I think I'll do that. Good book. I toss over to her. A harmless conversational beach ball. Someone left it in my cabin. It was this or a black beauty. She puts on fat, cheap sunglasses. Not bad either. Black stallion's better, though. She looks up at me with sunglasses still on. Two black bee-eyed uh, bee discs. Hmm. Huh. She turns back to her book. The pointed, I am now reading gesture, usually seen on crowded airplanes. And I am the annoying busybody next to her who hogs the armrest and says things like, business or pleasure? <laughs> I'm Nancy, I say. A new name, not Lydia, which isn't smart in those cramped quarters, but it comes out. My brain sometimes goes too fast for my own good. I was thinking of the girl's split lip, her sad, pre-owned vibe. And then I was thinking of abuse and prostitution. And then I was thinking of Oliver, my favorite musical as a child, and the doomed hooker Nancy, who loved her violent man right until he killed her. And then I was wondering why my feminist mother and I ever watched Oliver, considering as long as he needs me is basically a lilting pain to domestic violence. And then I was thinking that Diary Amy was also killed by her man. She was actually a lot like, I'm Nancy, I say. Greta. Sounds made up. Nice to meet you, uh, nice to meet you, Greta. I float away. Behind me, I hear the shwick of Greta's lighter, and then smoke wafts overhead like spindrifts. 
That's interesting. In the movie, it's um, Greta who actually comes up to her and is like very conversational, and Amy's trying not to make conversation. Can you say it's high noon in, in cowboy Amy voice? It's high noon. <laughs> <laughs> let's see yeah but that's that's interesting because Greta's uh, the, the that is very interesting I wonder where they're going with this let's find out um, 40 minutes later Greta sits down on the edge of the pool dangling her legs in the water it's hot she says the water she has a ooh, she has a husky, hearty voice, cigarettes and prairie dirt. That's great. Could have told me that earlier. Um, uh, maybe like uh, it's tough to do husky with my new with my male voice because um, it kind of comes out. Eh. Maybe I could just kind of I'll, I'll voice her a little like revy. And I know this isn't a feminine voice, but I'm gonna try to make it as feminine as possible. <laughs> And that will also draw uh, a difference between, you know, because right now Amy's voice in her head is up here, and then what actually comes out is this kind of accent thing, and then Re Greta can kind of sound a little grainy like this. So that'll be able to help you distinguish them a little easier uh, rather than just Greta and Amy's inside voice sounding the same. Uh, it's hot, she says. The water. She has a husky, hearty voice, cigarettes and prairie dirt. Like bath water, it's not very refreshing. The lake's not much cooler. I can't swim anyway, she says. I've never met anyone who can't swim. I can just barely. I lie. Doggy paddle. She ruffles her legs, the waves gently rocking my raft. So, what's it like here? She asks. Nice. Quiet. Good. That's what I need. Oh, that's interesting, because Greta's, I think, been here for a bit in the movie. So this is like a, this is a difference. I wonder why they made the changes. I turn to look at her. She has two gold necklaces, a perfectly round bruise the size of a plum near her left breast, and a shamrock tattoo just above her bikini line. Her swimsuit is brand new, cherry red, cheap, from the marina convenience store where I bought my raft. You on your own? I ask. Very. I am unsure what to ask next. Is there some sort of code that abused women use with each other? A language I don't know? Guy trouble? She twitches an eyebrow at me that seems to be a yes. Me too, I say. It's not like we weren't warned, she says. She cups her hand into the water, lets it dribble down her front. My mom, one of the first things she ever told me, going to school the first day, stay away from boys, they'll either throw rocks or look up your skirt. You should make a t-shirt that says that. She laughs. It's true, though. It's always true. My mom lives in a lesbian village down in Texas. I keep thinking I should join her. Everyone seems happy there. A lesbian village? Like a, what do you call it, a commune? A bunch of lesbians bought land, started their own society, sort of, no men allowed. Sounds just freaking great to me, world without men. She cups another handful of water, pulls up her sunglasses, and wets her face. Too bad I don't like pussy. She laughs. An old woman's angry bark laugh. So are there any asshole guys here I can start dating? She says. That's my, like, pattern. Run away from one, bump into the next. It's half empty most of the time. There's Jeff, the guy with the beard. He's actually really nice, I say. He's been here longer than me. How long are you staying? She asks. I pause. It's odd. I don't know the exact amount of time I will be here. I planned on staying until Nick was arrested, but I have no idea if he'll be arrested soon. Till he stops looking for you, huh? Greta guesses. Something like that. She examines me closely, frowns. 
My stomach tightens. I wait for her to say it. You look familiar. Never go, never go back to a man with fresh bruises. Don't give him the satisfaction. Greta intones. She stands up, gathers her things, dries her legs on the tiny towel. Good day, uh, good day killed, she says. For some reason, I give a thumbs up, which I've never done in my life. Come to my cabin when you get out, if you want to, she says. We can watch TV. I bring a fresh tomato from Dorothy, held in my palm like a shiny housewarming gift. Greta comes to the door and barely acknowledges me, as if I've been dropping over for years. She plucks the tomato from my hand. <laughs> Perfect, I was just making sandwiches, she says. Grab a seat. She points toward the bed, we have no sitting rooms here, and moves into her kitchenette, which has the same plastic cutting board, the same dull knife as mine. She slices the tomato. A plastic disc of lunch meat sits on the counter, the stomachy sweet smell filling the room. She sets two slippery sandwiches on paper plates, along with handfuls of goldfish crackers, and marches them into the bedroom area, her hand, her hand already on the remote, flipping from noise to noise. We sit on the edge of the bed, side by side watching the TV. Stop me if you see something, Greta says. I take a bite of my sandwich. My tomato slips out the side and onto my thigh. The Beverly Hillbillies, Suddenly Susan, Armageddon, Ellen Abbott Live. A photo of me fills the screen. I am the lead story. Again. I look great. You seen this? Greta asks, not looking at me, talking as if my disappearance were a rerun of, the, of a decent TV show. This woman vanishes on her five-year wedding anniversary. Husband acts real weird from the start, all sl all smiley and shit. Turns out he bumped, turns out he bumped up her life insurance, and they just found out the wife was pregnant, and the guy didn't want it. The screen cuts to another photo of me juxtaposed with amazing Amy. Greta turns to me. You remember those books? Of course. Oh, sorry, accent. Of course. <laughs> you like those books? Everyone likes those books. They're so cute. I say. Greta snorts. They're so fake. Close up of me. I wait for her to say how beautiful I am. She's not bad, huh? For like her age, she says. I hope I look like that. I hope I look that good when I'm forty. Ellen is filling the audience in on my story. My photo lingers on the screen. It's <laughs> adds to me like she was a spoiled rich girl. Greta says, high maintenance, bitchy. That is simply unfair. I'd left no evidence for anyone to, con to conclude that. Since I've moved to Missouri, well, since I'd come up with my plan, I'd been careful to be low maintenance, easygoing, cheerful, all those things people want women to be. I waved to neighbors. I ran errands for Moe's friends. I once brought cola to the ever-soiled Stucks Buckley. I visited, da I visited Nick's dad so that all the nurses could testify to how nice I was, so I could whisper over and over into Bill Dunn's spiderweb brain, I love you, come live with us, I love you, come live with us, just to see if it would catch. Nick's dad, oh, that's, ooh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great, that detail is not in the movie because, um... In the movie, Nick's dad doesn't sneak out of the house a second time. Uh, but if you remember, Nick's dad shows up at the house uh, in the backyard um, chapters ago. It's like the second time he's gotten out of the house during the course of the book. And uh, Nick's like, what are you doing here, dad? And he's like, she said that uh, she wanted me to come. That's awesome. Yeah, Greta's uh fucking digging in. <laughs> oh, I'm playing Spelunky, and what's great is you can have the damsel, quote unquote, a woman, a man, or a dog, regardless of the gender of your avatar. Oh, well, that's cool. I've never heard of Spelunky. Uh, where was I? Let's see. I was, I was in the middle of the, of the paragraph, but I stopped to talk because I love that. Nick's dad is what the people of Comfort Hill call a roamer. He's always wandering off. 
I love the idea of Bill Dunn, the living totem of everything Nick fears he could become, the object of Nick's most profound despair, showing up over and over and over on our doorstep. How does she seem bitchy? I ask. She shrugs. The TV goes to a commercial for air freshener. A woman is spraying air freshener so her family will be happy. Then to a commercial for very thin panty liners so a woman can wear a dress and dance and meet the man she will later spray air freshener for. <laughs> clean and bleed. Bleed and clean. Oh, that's really good. I love that. Because um, that's a callback to earlier when she's talking about the commercials. But it is also in the movie because in the movie... Um, I'm, she says clean and bleed, bleed and clean at some point. Uh, I think it's where she has the IV in her, her arm and she's getting all the blood out. Um, I'm pretty sure it's a line like clean and bleed, bleed and clean. They might've kept that for the movie, but, um, they didn't put it in at that point in the book where she's bleeding to have the, the, the blood on the floor. But that's, uh, ooh, that's great. Clean and bleed, bleed and clean. I gotta write that down. Page is this two sixty five, and it's interesting because like I don't think there's much left in the book. It's it's a decent chunk, but we're like we're making progress. Let's see. <clears throat> You can just tell, Greta says. She just sounds like a rich, bored bitch. Like those rich bitches who use their husband's money to start, like, cupcake companies and card shops and shit, boutiques. In New York, I had friends with all those kinds of businesses. They like to be able to say they worked, even though they only did the little stuff that was fun. Name the cupcake, order, this, order the stationery, wear the adorable dress that was from their very own store. She's definitely one of those, Greta said. Rich bitch putting on airs. Greta leaves to go to the bathroom, and I tiptoe into her kitchen, go into her fridge, and spit in her milk, her orange juice, and a container of potato salad, then tiptoe back to the bed. Flush, Greta returns. I mean, all that doesn't mean it's okay that he killed her. She's just another woman, made a very bad choice in her man. Oh, it's so good. Um, yeah, Amy is impulsive and very vengeful. Page 266, I believe. Yeah, because, like, in the movie, it's, uh, her Mountain Dew. Greta has a Mountain Dew, uh, that's, like, right next to her. And, and that's a lot cleaner, you know, because this is, like... Very calculated. Just like go in and spit in all of these things. Uh, that's some sp that's some spit. Parentheses e. Parentheses. That's good. Spite spit. That's very good. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's just another show of Amy. Just like she will destroy you. <laughs> like it's it's. Um, and that happens in the movie as well, where Greta says this bad shit about Amy, leaves, Amy spits in her stuff, and then Greta comes back and is like, I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't mean it's okay, he killed her, you know? And so, you know, it's funny, because if Amy had heard her say that, maybe she wouldn't have spit in her stuff, you know, but she's impulsive, she just, she does things out of spite, like you said. Um, ugh, damn. She is looking right at me, and I wait for her to say, Hey, wait a minute. But she turns back to the TV, rearranges herself so she's laying on her stomach like a child, her chin in her hands, her face directed at my image on the screen. Ah, oh, shit, here it goes, Greta says. People are hating on this guy. The show gets underway, and I feel a bit better. It is the apotheosis of Amy. <clears throat> Cam Campbell Macintosh, childhood friend. Amy is just a nurturing, motherly type of woman. She loves being. A she loved being a wife, and I know she would have been a great mother. But Nick, 
You just knew Nick was wrong somehow, cold and aloof and really calculating. You got the feeling that he was definitely aware of how much money Amy had. Campbell is lying. She got all googly around Nick. She absolutely adored him. But I'm sure she liked the idea that he only married me for my money. Oh, <laughs> I voiced Campbell like he was a dude. <laughs> Well, Campbell's supposed to be a woman, so there you go. Shauna Kelly, North Carthage residence. I found it really, really strange how totally unconcerned he was at the search for his wife. He was just, you know, chatting, passing the time, flirting around with me, who, who he didn't know from Adam. I tried to turn the conversation to Amy, and he would just, just no interest. I'm sure this desperate old slut absolutely did not try to turn the conversation toward me. Stephen Stucks Buckley, longtime friend of Nick Dunn. She was a sweetheart, sweet heart. And Nick, he just didn't seem that worried about Amy being gone. The guy who was always like that. The guy was always like that. Self-centered, stuck up a little. Like he made it all big in New York and we should all bow down. I despise Stucks Buckley. And what the fuck kind of name is that? Oh, that's cool. Wait, let me... Yeah, because... Yeah. <laughs> I remember because um, back when Stux was first mentioned, he talks about how Amy brought him a sandwich one time or something, and Nick was like, there's no way she did that. But, yeah. She says this uh, on the previous page where she's talking about, like, you know, that's unfair. I left no evidence for anyone to conclude that I was a bitch. I did this and this. Uh, and I forgot Stux's name for a second, but she says... I once brought cola to the ever-soiled Stux Buckley. Okay, so it was, it was soda. That's great that they brought that back. <clears throat> Noelle Hawthorne, looking like she w just got new highlights. I think he killed her. No one will say it, but I will. He abused her, and he bullied her, and he finally killed her. Good dog. Greta glances sideways at me, her cheeks smushed up under her face. Oh, I'm sorry. Under her, uh, Greta glances sideways at me, her cheeks smushed up under her hands, her face flickering in the TV glow. I hope that's not true, she says, that he killed her. It'd be nice to think that maybe she just got away, just ran away from him, and she's hiding out all safe and sound. She kicks her legs back and forth like a lazy swimmer. I can't tell if she's fucking with me. Ooh. Nick Dunn. Eight days gone. We searched every cranny of my father's house, which didn't take long since it's so pathetically empty. The cabinets, the closets. I yanked at the corners of rugs to see if they came up. I peeked into his washer and dryer, stuck a hand up his chimney. I even looked behind the toilet tanks. Very godfather of you. Go said. If, uh, if it were very godfather, I'd have found out what we were looking for and come out shooting. Tanner stood in the center of my dad's living room and tugged at the end of his lime tie. Go and I were smeared with dust and grime, but somehow Tanner's white button-down positively glowed as if it retained some of the strobe light glamour of New York. He was staring at the corner of a cabinet, chewing on his lip, tugging at the tie, thinking... The man had probably spent years perfecting this look, the shut-up client, I'm thinking, look. I don't like this, he finally said. We have a lot of uncontained issues here, and I won't go to the cops until we're very, very contained. My first instinct is to get ahead of the situation. Report that stuff in the shed before we get busted in. Uh, before we get busted with it. But if we don't know what Amy wants us to find here, and we don't know Andy's mindset... Nick... Do you have a guess what Andy's mindset is? I shrugged. Pissed. I mean, that makes me very, very nervous. We're in a very prickly situation, basically. We need to tell the cops about the woodshed. We have to be on the front end of that discovery. But I want to lay out for you what will happen when we do. And what will happen is, they will go after Go. It'll be one of two options. One... Go is your accomplice, she was helping you hide the stuff on her property, and in all likelihood, she knows you killed Amy. Come on, you can't be serious, I said. Nick, we'd be lucky with that version, Tanner said. They can interpret this however they want. 
How about this one? It was Go who stole your identity, who got those credit cards. She bought all that crap in there. Amy found out there was a confrontation. Go killed Amy. Then we get away. Then we get way, way ahead of this. Ahead of all this, I said. We tell them about the woodshed, and we tell them Amy's framing me. I think that is a bad idea in general, and right now it's a really bad idea if we don't have Andy on our side, because we'd have to tell them about Andy. Why? Because if we go to the cops with your story that Amy framed you, why do you keep saying my story like it's something I made up? <laughs> Good point. Uh, if we explain to the cops how Amy is, frame is framing you, we have to explain why she's framing you. Why? Because she found out you have a very pretty, very young girlfriend on the side. Do we really have to tell them that? I asked. Amy framed you for her murder because she was, what, bored? I swallowed my lips. We have to give them Amy's motive. It doesn't work otherwise. But the problem is if we set Andy gift wrapped on the doorstep and they don't buy the frame up theory, then we've given them your motive for murder. Money problems, check. Pregnant wife, check. Girlfriend, check. It's a murderer's triumvirate. Is that a word? Triumvirate? Triumvirate. You'll go down. Women will line up to tear you apart with their fingernails. He began pacing. But if we don't do anything and Andy goes to them on her own... So what do we do? I asked. I think the cops will laugh us out of the station if we say right now that Amy framed you. It's too flimsy. I believe you, but it's flimsy. But the treasure hunt clues, I started. Nick, even I don't understand those clues. I'm sorry, that's Go. <laughs> Nick, even I don't understand those clues, Go said. They're all inside baseball between you and Amy. There's only your word that they're leading you into. Uh, I see. There's only your word that they're leading you into. Incriminating situations. I, I mean, seriously, crummy jeans and visor equals Hannibal? Little brown house equals your dad's house, which is blue, Tanner added. I could feel Tanner's doubt. I needed to really show him Amy's character, her lies, her vindictiveness, her score settling. I needed other people to back me up, that my wife wasn't amazing Amy, but avenging Amy. Well, let's see if we can reach out to Andy today, Tanner finally said. That's interesting, because this version of... Uh, Tanner is very different from the one that got in the movie, because the one in the movie is Tyler Perry, and believes him, like, right away. I love that reference to Godfather, that scene made me realize how great a hiding place a toilet tank is. Oh yeah, I haven't seen it, but, uh, yeah, toilet tank is a good place to hide things. I think I saw that on Breaking Bad. Uh, Tanner. <laughs> Let's see if we could reach out to Andy today, Tanner finally said. Isn't it a risk to wait? Go asked. Tanner nodded. It's a risk. We have to move fast. If another bit of evidence pops up, if the police get a search warrant for the woodshed, if Andy goes to the cops... She won't, I said. She bit you, Nick. She won't. She's pissed off right now, but she's... I, I can't believe she'd do that to me. She, she knows I'm innocent. Nick, you said you were with Andy for about an hour in the morning Amy disappeared, yes? Yes, from about 10.30 to right before 12. So where were you between 7.30 and 10? Tanner asked. You said you left the house at 7.30, right? Where'd you go? I chewed on my cheek. Where did you go, Nick? I need to know. It's, it's not relevant. Nick! Go snapped. I just did what I do some mornings. I pretended to leave, then I drove to the most deserted part of our complex, and I... One of the houses there has an unlocked garage. And? Tanner said. And I, I read magazines. Excuse me? I read back issues of my old magazine. I still missed my magazine. I hid copies like porn and read them in secret, because I didn't want anyone feeling sorry for me. I looked up, and both Tanner and Go felt very... Very sorry for me.
I drove back to my house just after noon, was greeted by a street full of news vans, reporters, camped up on my lawn. Um, I couldn't get into my driveway, was forced to park in front of the house. I took a breath, then flung myself out of the car. They set on me like starving birds, pecking and fluttering, breaking formation and gathering again. Nick, did you know Amy was pregnant? Nick, what is your alibi? Nick, did you kill Amy? I made it inside, locked myself in. On each side of the door were windows, so I braved it and quickly pulled down the shades, all the while cameras clicking at me, questions called. Nick, did you kill Amy? Once the shades were pulled, it was like covering a canary for the night. The noise out front stopped. I went upstairs and satisfied my shower craving. I closed my eyes and let the spray dissolve the dirt from my dad's house. When I opened them back up, the first thing I saw was Amy's pink razor on the soap dish. It felt ominous, malevolent. My wife was crazy. I was married to a crazy woman. It's every asshole's mantra, I married a psycho bitch. But I got a small, nasty bite of, set of gratification. I really did marry a genuine, bona fide psycho bitch. Nick, meet your wife, the world's foremost mindfucker. I was not as big an asshole as I'd thought. An asshole, yes, but not on a grandiose scale. The cheating that had been preemptive, a subconscious reaction to five years yoked to a mad woman. Of course I'd find myself attracted to an uncomplicated, good-natured hometown girl. It's like when people with iron deficiencies crave red meat. Ugh, Nick. <laughs> Ah, oh, just getting some water. Oh, a character has a meeting with two bad guys where he'll be checked for weapons. But he had a gun planted in the toilet tank at the meeting place ahead of time. He excuses himself to the restroom, gets the gun, takes out the bad guys. Ooh. That is, that is dope. I, that's very cool. And it reminds me of a thing that I'm writing, which is, might give me an idea. I don't know. That's, that's, that's cool. Alrighty. I should watch The Godfather. Even if it's not... I don't know the quality of it, but I'm just saying, even if it wasn't good by today's standards, it's good to, like, watch old movies. It's good to watch media in general, even if it's bad or good, uh, just because I will gain something from it, you know? You learn what not to do, or you learn what's to do, or, you know, I, I, I gain things from all experiences. That's why I like... Um, in the D&D campaign that we're doing right now, uh, season two of Lost in the Multiverse, we're doing a campaign with Monster of the Week. And if you fuck something up, you get an experience point. And when you get five experience points, you go up a level, which I find really fucking cool because it mimics real life. You know, like, even if you fuck up something, you still gain experience from that. And that's how you level up by fucking up. That's I find that very cool. I keep thinking of things and then having to write them down. Dope. Okay. Boop. Let's continue. Where are you at? Oh, yeah. Like, Nick has a point that Amy is a crazy person, but I don't like how he's getting gratification, being like, see, I'm not that big of an asshole. My wife's just crazy. It's like... No, no, that's, uh, don't excuse yourself <laughs> because of that. Uh, you are still very bad. I was telling, I was telling off when the doorbell rang. I leaned out the bathroom door and heard the reporter's voices geared up again. Do you believe your son-in-law, Mary Beth? What does it feel like to know you'll be a grandpa, Rand? Do you think Nick killed your daughter, Mary Beth? 
Oh, that's cool that you can like you know who's in the house uh before that let's see nick feels justified boom right and all my notes 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 they stood side by side on my front step grim faced their backs rigid <laughs> oh yeah cuz he's been trying to reach them there were about a dozen journalists, paparazzi, but they made the noise of twice that many. Do you believe your son-in-law, Mary Beth? What does it feel like to know you'll be a grandpa, Rand? Oh, so they're just repeating the same questions. The Elliots entered with mumbled hellos and downcast eyes, and I slammed the door shut on the cameras. Rand put a hand on my arm and immediately removed it under Mary Beth's gaze. Sorry, I was in the shower. My hair was still dripping, uh, wetting the shoulders of my t-shirt. Mary Beth's hair was greasy, her clothes wilted. She looked at me like I was insane. Tanner Bolt, are you serious? She asked. What do you mean? I mean, Nick, Tanner Bolt, are you serious? He only represents guilty people. She leaned in closer, grabbed my chin. What's on your cheek? Hives. Stress. I turned away from her. That's not true about Tanner, Mary Beth. It's not. He's the best in the business. I need him right now. The, the police, all they're doing is looking at me. <clears throat> that certainly seems to be the case, she said. It looks like a bite mark. It's hives. Mary Beth released an aggravated sigh, turned the corner into the living room. This is where it happened, she asked. Her, her face had collapsed into a series of fleshy ridges, eye bags and saggy cheeks, her lips downcast. We think. Some sort of altercation, confront uh, <laughs> some sort of uh, altercation, confrontation, also happened in the kitchen. Because of the blood. Mary Beth touched the ottoman, tested it, lifted it a few times, and let it drop. I wish you hadn't fixed everything. You made it look like nothing ever happened. Mary Beth, he has to live here, Rand said. I still don't understand how... I mean, what if the police didn't find everything? What if... I don't know. It, it seems like they gave up. If they just let the house go. Open to anyone. I'm sure they got everything. Rand said and squeezed her hand. Why don't we ask if we can look at Amy's things so you can pick something special, okay? He glanced at me. Would that be all right, Nick? It'd be a comfort to have something of hers. He turned back to his wife. That blue sweater Nana knitted for her. I don't want the goddamn blue sweater, Rand. She flung his hand off, began pacing around the room, picking up items. She pushed the ottoman with a toe. This is the ottoman, Nick? She asked. The one they said was flipped over, but it shouldn't have been? That's the ottoman. She stopped pacing, kicked it again, and watched it remain upright. Mary Beth, I'm, I'm sure Nick is exhausted. Rand glanced at me with a meaningful smile. Like we all are. I think we should do what we came for, and- This is not what I came here for, Rand. Not some stupid sweater of Amy's to snuggle up against like I'm three. I want my daughter. I don't want her stuff. Her stuff means nothing to me. I want Nick to tell us what the hell is going on because this whole thing is starting to stink. I never- I never- I never felt so foolish in my life. She began crying swiping away the tears, clearly furious at herself for crying. We trusted you with our daughter. We trusted you, Nick. Just tell us the truth. She put a quivering index finger under my nose. Is it true? Did you not want the baby? Did you not love Amy anymore? Did you, did you hurt her? I wanted to smack her. Mary Beth and Rand had raised Amy. She was literally their work product. They had created her. I wanted to say the words, Your daughter is the monster here, but I couldn't. Not until we told the police. And so I remained dumbfounded, trying to think of what I could say. But I looked like I was stonewalling. Mary Beth, I would never... I would never! I could never! That's all I hear from your goddamn mouth! You know, I hate even looking at you anymore. I really do. There's something wrong with you. There's something missing inside you to act the way you've been acting. Even if it turns out you're totally blameless, I will never forgive you for how casually you've taken all of this. You think you've mislaid a, a damn umbrella after all 
Amy gave up for you after all she did for you, and this is what she gets in return? It... you... I don't believe you, Nick. That's what I came here to let you know. I don't believe in you. Not anymore. She began sobbing, turned away, and flung herself out the front door as the thrilled cameraman filmed her. She got in the car, and two reporters pressed against the window, knocking on it, trying to get her to say something. In the living room, we could hear them repeating and repeating her name. Mary Beth, Mary Beth. Rand remained, hands in his pockets, trying to figure out what role to play. Tanner's voice, we have to keep the Elliots on our side, was Greek chorusing in my ear. Rand opened his mouth, and I headed him off. Rand, tell me what I can do. Just say it, Nick. Say what? I, I don't want to ask, and you don't want to answer. I get that. But I need... I need to hear you say it. You didn't kill our daughter. He laughed and teared up at the same time. Jesus Christ, I can't keep my head straight. Rand said. He was turning pink, flushed, a nuclear sunburn. I can't figure out how this is happening. I can't figure it out. He was still smiling. A tear dribbled on his chin and fell to his shirt collar. Just say it, Nick. Rand, I did not kill Amy or hurt her in any way. He kept his eyes on me. Do you believe me? That I didn't physically harm her? Rand laughed again. <laughs> I don't know what I was... <laughs> you know what I was about to say? I was about to say I don't know what to believe anymore. And then I thought, that's someone else's line. That's a line from a movie, not something I should be saying. And I wonder, for a second, am I in a movie? Can I stop being in this movie? And then I know I can't. But for a second, you think, I'll say something different and this will all change. But it won't, will it? With one quick Jack Russell head shake, he turned and followed his wife to the car. Instead of feeling sad, I felt alarmed. Before the Elliots were even out of my driveway, I was thinking, we need to go to the cops quickly, soon, before the Elliots started discussing their loss of faith in public. I needed to prove my wife was not who she pretended to be, not amazing Amy, avenging Amy. I flashed to Tommy O'Hara, the guy who called the tip line three times, the guy Amy had accused of raping her. Tanner had gotten some background on him. He wasn't the macho Irish man I'd pictured from his name, not a firefighter or cop. He wrote for a humor website based in Brooklyn, a decent one, and his contributor photo revealed him to be a scrawny guy with dark rimmed glasses and an uncomfortable amount of thick black hair, wearing a wry grin and a t-shirt for a band called The Bingos. He picked up on the first ring. Yeah? This is Nick Dunn. You called me about my wife. Amy Dunn? Amy Elliott. I have to talk with you. I heard a pause, waited for him to hang up on me like Hillary Handy. Call me back in ten minutes. I did. The background was a bar. I knew the sound well enough. The murmur of drinkers, the clatter of ice cubes the strange pops of noise as people called for drinks or hailed friends. I had a burst of homesickness for my own place. Okay, thanks, he said. Had to get to a bar. Seemed like a scotch conversation. His voice got progressively closer, thicker. I could picture him huddling protectively over a drink, cupping his mouth to the phone. Oh, interesting. They are, they're going to have this conversation over the phone. In the movie, um, Nick meets him in a bar, and it's, I think he has that, that, uh, that line, like a scotch conversation. That's interesting that they're having this over the phone. Mary Beth is such a well-written character. Yeah, right? Like, I'm very surprised, because in the book, uh, I'm sorry, in the movie, she's not nearly this well fleshed out, um... But you could say that about every character. Every character is way better fleshed out in the book because you have so much more room to play around, you know, because a movie has to be between an hour and a half to two hours or whatever, and uh, you just don't have enough time to cover everything that's happening. But 
But, uh, yeah, in the movie, this conversation happens in a bar. I'm such a weird fucking Gone Girl research... I was going to say expert, but I'm not. I just do. I just did a lot of research on Gone Girl. But I was reading the screenplay uh, one scene at a time and playing the movie so I could see what was changed uh, from screenplay to what got on the screen. And now reading the book, it's like I have three different versions of Gone Girl going around in my head, and I'm like, what version is what? But I think there was a line in the movie where they say this seems like a scotch conversation, but if it didn't make it in the movie, it was in the screenplay. That's true. I'm glad that I'm getting the chance to experience the novel before watching the movie. Yeah, yeah, because um, this this is very different in a cool way. And some characters are just completely cut or changed to such a degree they no longer re like resemble this at all. The one that is the most different, I believe, is Tanner Bolt. Because Tanner Bolt, in the movie played by Tyler Perry, is very um, just a chill dude who, like very calm collected he's less slimy because tanner is clearly Saul goodman you know like i'm giving him a new york accent he's very slimy in the books and doesn't really believe nick uh but in the movie tanner believes him immediately and it's like cool this is how we fight this um and andy is also the other example andy is like a fucking badass in the books uh has a complete turn of character she's very well written and then you get to her in the movie, and she's she's in, like, three scenes, and she's barely in two of them. Uh, so it's very cool to get to, like, experience this. So this is them on the phone right now. Tommy is in a bar drinking scotch. Let's see. Um, I'm going to start with this paragraph again. <clears throat> okay, thanks, he said. Had to get to a bar. Seemed like a scotch conversation. His voice got progressively closer, thicker. I could picture him huddling protectively over a drink, cupping his mouth to the phone. So, I began. I got your messages. Right. She's still missing, right, Amy? Yes. Can I ask you what you think has happened? He said. To Amy. Oh, fuck it. I wanted a drink. I went into my kitchen, next best thing to my bar, and poured myself one. I've been trying to be more careful about the booze, but it felt so good. The tang of a scotch, a dark room with the blinding sun right outside. Can I ask you why you called? I replied. I've been watching the coverage, he said. You're fucked. I am. I wanted to talk to you because I thought it was interesting that you try to get in touch considering the rape charge. Ah, you know about that, he said. I know there was a rape charge, but I don't necessarily believe you're a rapist. I wanted to hear what you had to say. Yeah. I heard him take a gulp of his scotch, kill it, shake the ice cubes around. I caught the story on the news one night. Your story. Amy's. I was in bed, eating Thai, minding my own business, Totally fucked me in the head. Her. After all these years. He called to the bartender for another. So my lawyer said no way I should talk to you, but... What can I say? I'm too fucking nice. I can't let you twist. God, I wish you could still smoke in bars. This is a scotch and cigarette conversation. Tell me, I said. About the assault charge. The rape. Like I said, man, I've seen the coverage. The media is shitting all over you. I mean, you're the guy. So I should leave well enough alone. I don't need that girl back in my life, even, like, tangentially. But shit. I wish someone had done me the favor. So do me the favor, I said. First of all, she dropped the charges. You know that, right? I know. Did you do it? Fuck you. Of course I didn't do it. Did you do it? No. Well, Tommy called again for his scotch. Let me ask. Your marriage was good. Your marriage was good? Amy was happy? I stayed silent. You don't have to answer, because, uh, but I'm, I'm going to guess no. Amy was not happy. For whatever reason, I'm not even going to ask. I can guess, but I'm not going to ask. 
but I know you must know this. Amy likes to play God when she's not happy. Old Testament God. Meaning? She doles out punishment, Tommy said. Hard. He laughed into the phone. <laughs> I mean, you should see me, he said. I do not look like some alpha male rapist. I look like a twerp. I am a twerp. My go-to karaoke song is Sister Christian for crying out loud. I weep during Godfather 2. Every time. He coughed after a swallow. It seemed like a moment to loosen up. Frito? I asked. Frito, man, yeah. Poor Frito. Stepped over. Most men have sports as the lingua franca of dudes. This was the film geek equivalent to discussing some great play in a famous football game. We both knew the line, and the fact that we both knew it eliminated a good day's worth of are we copacetic small talk. He took another drink. It was so fucking absurd. Tell me. You're not taping this or anything, right? No one's listening in, because I don't want that. Just us. I'm on your side. Yeah, that's what's interesting to me is that they have it over the phone, because, like, this could just be recorded, but... So, I meet Amy at a party. This is, like, seven years ago now, and she's so damn cool. Just hilarious and weird and cool. We just clicked, you know? And I don't click with a lot of girls, at least not girls who look like Amy. So I'm thinking... Well, first I'm thinking I'm being punked. Where's the catch, you know? But we start dating... And we date a few months, two, three months, and then I find out the catch. She's not the girl I thought I was dating. She can quote funny things, but she doesn't actually like funny things. She'd rather not laugh, anyway. In fact, she'd rather that I not laugh, either, or be funny, which is awkward since it's my job. But to her, it's all a waste of time. I, I mean, I can't even figure out why she started dating me in the first place, because it seems pretty clear that she doesn't even like me. Does that make sense? I nodded, swallowed a gulp of scotch. Yeah, it does. So I start making excuses not to hang out so much. I don't call it off because I'm an idiot and she's gorgeous. I'm hoping it might turn around. But you know, I'm making excuses fairly regularly. I'm stuck at work, I'm on deadline, I have a friend in town, my monkey is sick, whatever. And I start seeing this other girl, kind of sort of seeing her very casual. No big deal. Or so I think. But Amy finds out how I still don't know. For all I know, she was staking out my apartment, but... Shit. Take a drink. We both took a swallow. Amy comes over to my place one night. I had been seeing this other girl like a month. And Amy comes over and she's all back like she used to be. She's got some bootleg DVD of a comic I like. An underground performance in, Dur uh, in Durham. And she's got a sack of burgers and we watch the DVD. And she's got her leg flopped over mine. And then she's nestling into me and... Sorry, she's, she's your wife. My main point is the girl knew how to work me. And we end up... You had sex. Consensual sex, yes. And she leaves, and everything is fine. Kiss goodbye at the door, the whole shebang. Then what? The next thing I know, two cops are at my door, and they've done a rape kit on Amy, and she has wounds consistent with forcible rape, and she has ligature marks on her wrist. And when they search my apartment, they're, on the headboard of my bed are two ties, like neckties tucked down near the mattress, and the ties are, quote, consistent with the ligature marks. Had you tied her up? No, the sex wasn't even that, that, you know? I was totally caught off guard. She must have tied them there when I, I got up to take a piss or whatever. I mean, I was in some serious shit. It was looking very bad. And then suddenly, she dropped the charges. A couple of weeks later, I got a note, anonymous, typed, says... Maybe next time you'll think twice. And you never heard from her again? Never heard from her again. And you didn't try to press charges against her or anything? Uh, no. Fuck no. I was just glad she went away. Then last week I'm eating my Thai food, sitting in my bed, watching the news report. On Amy. On you. Perfect wife, anniversary, no body, real shitstorm. I swear, I broke out in a sweat. I thought... That's Amy. 
She's graduated to murder. Holy shit. I'm serious, man. I bet whatever she's got cooked up for you, it's drum fucking tight. You should be fucking scared. That is the end of the chapter. That's, ooh. Uh, I have three different versions of that scene going on in my head because I have the screenplay, I have the movie, and I have this. Um, very interesting. There's a very good line in the movie where it is uh, part of this, but uh, Gillian wrote it better in the movie where it's... I forget exactly what it is, but it's, um, he sees Amy on TV and he says, I thought, that's Amy. She's graduated from being raped to being murdered or something like that. And that's like a, that's a really good line. Um, in the movie, uh, she actually is tied up during the sex. Uh, I think just to make it cleaner. They just had that happen in the movie. But it's also um, a lot worse for Tommy in the movie because I don't remember if she drops the charges, but there's this whole thing where he's like on a list. You know, he, he has to like talk to people when he moves places and stuff. And it's like uh, a lot worse of a situation. She basically just destroys his life in the movie. Um, but, Ugh, pardon me, damn, that's like, yeesh. because now you're starting to be like, hmm, or rather that's where I took a turn, because I can understand wanting revenge against being abused, but this is a line that's like, holy shit, that's not okay. <laughs> um, you know, uh, at least in my opinion. Um, but it's interesting because in the movie, we don't get Amy's side. And I wonder if they're going to go into Amy's side of what happened with Tommy. Because Tommy could very well be lying about, you know, maybe he was just cheating on her. Um, but we only see his side of it because it's from Nick's point of view. But, uh, you know, I'm just wondering what the full picture is and if they get into it. Uh, seeing it in the movie, when I saw it, uh, like I said, the movie changes based on like how I am as a person and how much I've matured. And I didn't understand uh, that narrators could be unreliable before. So the first couple times I saw it, I took it at face value and was like, oh shit, you know, Tommy is 100% in telling the truth. But now as I've grown and matured as a person and I have encountered a lot of dudes who have been like, uh, who have lied about that and told the exact same lie that Tommy tells, if it is a lie, we don't know yet, um, of like, yeah, she's crazy, I didn't do anything wrong, but then there's actual proof that they did do something wrong. Um... So I don't know what to think at this point. So I wonder if they will go into Amy's perspective. Uh, but the more times I see the movie nowadays, the more I'm questioning Tommy's narrative of like, is this actually the truth or is Tommy telling half a lie? You know, where, where does the truth end? Where does it begin? <laughs> That's why I don't tie women up during sex. The fact that nobody has sex with me also helps. Yeah, I feel, I feel you're in the clear. Uh, it's, um, yeah, it's very chilling, and I wonder, it's, it's, I wonder what's better, like, narratively. Is it better to have this scene happen in a bar, uh, or is it better to have it where these two guys are talking over the phone? I guess, movie-wise, I, I, I understand why they moved it to a physical bar, because it's more interesting to look at rather than cutting between two shots of two men having a, a phone conversation. I'm not sure which one I like better. I will, I will think on that. Um, let's do it. Here's an Amy chapter. Amy Elliot Dunn, Eight Days Gone. 
<laughs> it feels like a really incriminating conversation to have in a public setting. It does. Um, yeah, I think in the movie there's barely anyone in the bar and they're kind of like secretive about it. But it's still like I could hear their conversation if I was with them in the bar. So there's advantages and disadvantages. Uh, you know, because especially since the media is hounding Nick. Yeah, like there could just be someone like listening in on the phone conversation or there could be someone in the bar you have advantages and disadvantages of either cuz you could just i don't know how police stuff works but i assume you could just get a warrant to be like hey can we tap his phone <clears throat> or get phone records after the fact you know and then they just have this whole conversation that has been conveniently recorded uh Eight days gone. I am wet from the bumper boats. We got more than five dollars worth of time because the two sun-stunned teenage girls would rather flip through their gossip magazines and smoke cigarettes than try to hurt us off the water. So we spent a good thirty minutes on our lawnmower motor-propelled ships, ramming into each other and turning wild twists, and then we got bored and left of our own accord. Greta, Jeff, and I, an odd crew in a strange place, Greta and Jeff have become good friends in just a day, which is how people do it here, where there's nothing else to do. I think Greta's deciding whether she'll make Jeff another of her disastrous mating choices. Jeff would like it. He prefers her. She is much prettier than I am right now in this place. Cheap pretty. She's wearing a bikini top and jean shorts with a spare shirt tucked into the back pocket for when she wants to enter a store. T-shirts, wood carvings, decorative rocks, or restaurants, burger, barbecue, taffy. She wants us to get Old West photos taken, but that's not going to happen for reasons, aside from the fact that I don't want redneck lake person lice. Um, that's interesting. In the movie, um, Amy gives herself a black eye with a hammer, um, you know make herself look abused, and give her a different look so she's not as recognizable. Uh, but that hasn't happened. And also, there's a detail where Jeff has a broken arm in the movie. Um, I wonder if that'll come up, or if it's just... I like it in the movie. It gives a little... Uh, a little detail, you know, because uh, in the book you get to go into so much shit... But in the movie, you only have a certain amount of time to be like, this is a character. This is their thing. Uh, so by giving Jeff a broken arm, it tells a whole story that you don't have to get into. It just adds a little color. We end up settling for a few... Uh, ooh, we end up settling for a few rounds on a decrepit miniature golf course. The fake grass is torn off in patches. The alligators and windmills that once moved mechanically are still. Jeff does the honors instead, twirling the windmill, snapping open and shut the gator jaws. Some holes are simply unplayable, the grass rolled up like carpeting. The farmhouse with its beckoning mouse hole collapsed in on itself. So we roam between courses in no particular order. No one is even keeping score. Pardon me. Hmm. I was about to say, that doesn't sound like Amy, because Amy would want to keep score. But then she says, This would have annoyed old Amy to no end, the haphazardness of it all, the pointlessness, but I'm learning to drift, and I do it quite well. I am overachieving at aimlessness. I am a type A alpha girl lollygagger, the leader of a gang of heartbroken kids, running wild across this lonely strip of amusements, each of us smarting from the betrayals of a loved one. Ooh, I want to write that down. Page 280. Because <laughs> even when she's not trying to overachieve, she's overachieving in underachieving. She's like, I am the best. I'm the best at not giving a crap because I care so much. I catch Jeff, cuckolded, divorced, complicated cust uh, custody agreement or arrangement. I'm sorry. I catch Jeff. Cuckolded, divorced, complicated custody, custody arrangements, furrowing his brow as we pass a love tester. 
Squeeze the metal grip and watch the temperature rise from just a fling to soulmates. The odd equation, a crushing clutch, means true love. It reminds me of poor smacked around Greta, who often places her thumb over the bruise on her chest like it's a button she can push. You're up, Greta says to me. She's drying her ball off on her shorts. Twice she's gone into the cesspool of dirty water. I get in position, wiggle once or twice, and put my bright red ball straight into the birdhouse opening. It disappears for a second, then reappears out of chute and into the hole. Disappear, reappear. I feel a wave of anxiety. Everything reappears at some points, even me. I am anxious because I think my plans have changed. I have changed plans only twice so far. The first was the gun. I was going to get a gun, and then on the morning I disappeared, I was going to shoot myself. Nowhere dangerous, through a, a calf or a wrist. I would leave behind a bullet with my flesh and blood on it. A struggle occurred. Amy was shot. But then I realized there was a... Uh, this was a little too macho, even, for me. It would hurt for weeks, and I don't love pain. My sliced arm feels better now, thank you very much. But I still like the idea of a gun. It made for a nice MacGuffin. Not Amy was shot, but Amy was scared. So I dolled myself up and went to the mall on Valentine's Day. So I'd be, so I'd be remembered. I couldn't get one, but it's not a big deal as far as changed plans go. The other one is considerably more extreme. I've decided I'm not going to die. I have the discipline to kill myself, but can't stomach the injustice. It's not fair that I have to die. Not really die. I don't want to. I'm not the one who did anything wrong. The problem now, though, is money. It's so ludicrous that of all things, it's money that should be an issue for me. But I have only a finite amount, $9,132 at this point. I will need more. This morning I went to chat with Dorothy, as always holding a handkerchief so as to not leave fingerprints. I told her it was my grandmother's. I tried to give her a vague impression of southern wealth gone to squander, very blanched a boy. I leaned against her desk as she told me, in great bureaucratic detail, about a, about a blood thinner she can't afford. The woman is an encyclopedia of denied pharmaceuticals. And then I said, just to test the situation, I know what you mean, I'm not sure where I'm going to get rent for my cabin after another week or two. She blinked at me, and blinked back toward the TV set, a game show where people screamed and cried a lot. She took a grandmotherly interest in me. She'd certainly let me stay on indefinitely. The cabins were half empty, no harm. You better get a job then, Dorothy said, not turning away from the TV. A contestant made a bad choice. The prize was lost. A wah-wah sound effect voiced her pain. A job like what? What kind of job can I get around here? I'm cleaning, babysitting. Basically, I was supposed to be a housewife for pay. Irony enough for a million hang-in-there posters. It's true that not even in our lowly Missouri state, I didn't ever have to actually budget. I couldn't go out and buy a new car just because I wanted to, but I never had to think about the day-to-day -day stuff. Coupon clipping and buying generic and knowing how much milk costs off the top of my head. My parents never bothered teaching me this, and so they left me unprepared for the real world. For instance, when Greta complained that the convenience store at the marina charged $5 for a gallon of milk, I winced because the kid there always charged me $10. I thought that seemed like a lot, but it hadn't occurred to me that the little pimply teenager just threw out a number to see if I'd pay. So I'd budgeted, but my budget, guaranteed, according to the internet, to last me six to nine months, is clearly off. And so I am off. When we're done with golf, I win. Of course I do. I know because I'm keeping score in my head. We go to the hot dog stand next door for lunch, and I slip around the corner to dig into my zippered money belt under my shirt. And when I glance back, Greta has followed me. She catches me right before I can stuff the thing away. Oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, 281. I want to put that because she can't even. Page 281. Still keeping score. Because of course she is. In the movie, um, this is Greta discovering her her uh, 
fanny pack of money. And in the movie, she wins a hole at the golf course. You know, she gets a hole in one or whatever the fuck. And she jumps and the money, fall, uh, the, the, the pack falls off of her and it opens a little so you can see all the money coming out. That's a lot better narratively and it doesn't involve uh, Greta having to follow her to see the money. Uh, so I like it better. Um, because otherwise, from a writing perspective, if you're going for screenplay stuff, there's no purpose to them being on the golf course if it doesn't cause something to happen or have a, you know... Uh, right now in the book, it serves the purpose of scorekeeping. Amy is still scorekeeping, you know. Um, but in the movie, she doesn't. We don't get to hear her inner thoughts, so there's no purpose to the golf, the mini golf course, unless there's a. Uh, it has something to do with something. Uh, so that's probably why they did it in the movie, and I like that better. Where there's a, you know, she lets her guard down, she gets excited, and then the money bag falls off of her. Uh, so I like that a lot better. That scorekeeping says a lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's... Even when she's pretending to be someone else, she can't stop. Uh, do I want to write down? Yeah, let's talk about the golf course. Boop. All right. <clears throat> Ever heard of a purse, money bags? She cracks. Um, this will be an ongoing problem. A person on the run needs lots of cash, but a person on the run, by definition, has nowhere to keep the cash. Thankfully, Greta doesn't press the issue. She knows we are both victims here. We sit in the sun on a metal picnic bench and eat hot dogs. White buns wrapped around cylinders of phosphate with relish, so green it looks toxic. And it may be the greatest thing I've ever eaten because I am dead Amy and I don't care. Guess what Jeff found in, in his cabin for me, Greta says. Another book by the Martian Chronicle guy. Ray Bradborough, Jeff says. Bradbury, I think. <laughs> oh, that's so good that she's like just, uh, she can't stop. She's just... <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Something wicked this way comes, Greta says. It's good. She chirps the last bit as if it were there. Oh, sorry. She chirps the last bit as if that were all to say about a book. It's good or bad. I liked it or didn't. No discussions of the writing, the themes, the nuances, the structure. Just good or bad. Like a hot dog. Um, I read it when I first moved in there, Jeff says. It is good. Creepy. He catches me, wa uh, he catches me watching him and makes a goblin face, all crazy eyes and leering tongue. He isn't my type. The fur on the face is too bristly. He does suspicious things with fish, but he's nice-looking, attractive. His eyes are very warm, not like Nick's frozen blues. I wonder if I, in quotations, might like sleeping with him, a nice slow screw with his body pressed against mine and his breath in my ear, the bristles on my cheeks, not the lonely way Nick fucks where our bodies barely connect. Right angle from behind, L-shaped from the front, and then he's out of bed almost immediately, hitting the shower, leaving me pulsing in his wet spot. Okay, I got your tongue, Jeff says. He never calls me by my name, as if to acknowledge that we both know I've lied. He says, this lady, or pretty woman, or you. I wonder what he would call me in bed. Baby, maybe. Just thinking. Uh-oh, he says, and smiles again. Um, you were thinking about a boy, I can tell, Greta says. Maybe. I thought we were steering clear of the assholes for a while, she says. Tend to our chickens. Last night after Ellen Abbott, I was too excited to go home, so we shared a six-pack and imagined our recluse life as the token straight girls on Greta's mother's lesbian compound raising chickens and hanging laundry to dry in the sun. The objects of gentle, platonic courtship from older women with gnarled knuckles and indulgent laughs. Denim and corduroy and clogs and never worrying about makeup or hair or nails, breast size or hip size, or having to pretend to be the understanding wifey, the supportive girlfriend who loves everything her man does. Not all guys are assholes, Jeff says. 
Greta makes a non-committal noise. <laughs> of course, of Jeff. Jeff is a lot slimier in the movie. He like hits on them, and that's their first interaction with him. He doesn't bring uh, Amy Fish or anything. We return to our cabins, liquid limbed. I feel like a water balloon left in the sun. All I want to do is sit under my sputtering window air conditioner and blast my skin with the cool while watching TV. I found a rerun channel that shows nothing but old 70s and 80s shows, Quincy and The Love Boats and Eight is Enough, but first comes Ellen Abbott's my new favorite show. Nothing new. Nothing new. Ellen doesn't mind speculating. Believe me, she's hosted an array of strangers from my past who swear they are my friends, and they all have lovely things to say about me even the ones who never much liked me. Post-life fondness. Knock on the door, and I know it will be Greta and Jeff. Switch off the TV, and there they are on my doorstep, aimless. What you doing? Jeff asks. Reading, I lie. He sets down a six-pack of beer on my counter, Greta padding in behind. Oh, I thought we heard the TV. Three is literally a crowd in these small cabins. They are blocking the door for a second, sending a pulse of nervousness through me. Why are they blocking the door? And then they keep moving, and they are blocking my bedside table. Inside my bedside table is my money belt, packed with $8,000 in cash, hundreds, fifties, and $20 bills. The money belt is hideous, flesh-colored, and bunchy. I can't possibly wear all my money... Uh, I can't possibly wear all my money at once. I leave some scattered around the cabin, but I try to wear most. When I do, I am as conscious of it as a girl at the beach with a maxi pad. A perverse part of me enjoys spending money, because every time I pull off a wad of 20s, there's less money to hide, to worry about being stolen or lost. Jeff clicks on the TV, and Ellen Abbott, and Amy, buzz into focus. He nods, smiles to himself. Wanna watch Amy? Greta asks. I can't tell if she used a comma. Want to watch Amy, or want to watch Amy? Nah. Jeff, why don't you grab your guitar and we can sit on the porch? Jeff and Greta exchange a look. Aw, oh, but that's what you were watching, right? Greta says. She points at the screen, and it's me and Nick at a benefit. Me in a gown, my hair pulled back in a ch chignon. And I look more like I look now, with my short hair. It's boring, I say. Oh, I don't think it's boring at all, Greta says, and flops down on my bed. I think what a fool I am to have let these two people come inside, to have assumed I could control them when they are feral creatures, people used to finding the angle, exploiting the weakness, always needing, whereas I am new to this. Needing. Those people who keep backyard pumas and living room chimps. These must be how they feel when their adorable pet rips them open. You know what? Would you guys mind? I feel kind of crummy. Too much sun, I think. They look surprised and a little offended, and I wonder if I've got it wrong. That they are harmless, and I'm just paranoid. I'd like to believe that. Sure, sure, of course, Jeff says. They shuffle out of my cabin, Jeff grabbing his beer on the way. A minute later, I hear Ellen Abbott snarling from Greta's cabin. The accusatory questions. Why did? Why didn't? Uh, how can you explain? Why did I ever let myself get friendly with anyone here? Why didn't I keep to myself? How can I explain my actions if I'm found out? I can't be discovered. If I were ever found, I'd be the most hated woman on the planet. I'd go from being the beautiful, kind, doomed, pregnant victim of a selfish, cheating bastard to being the bitter bitch who exploited the good hearts of all America's citizens. Ellen Abbott would devote show after show to me, angry callers venting their hate. This is just another example of a spoiled rich girl doing what she wants, when she wants, and not thinking of anyone else's feelings, Ellen. I think she should disappear for life in prison. Like that. It would, it would go like that. I've read conflicting internet information on the penalties for faking a death or framing a spouse for said death, but I know the public opinion would be brutal. No matter what I do after that, 
Feed orphans, cuddle lepers. When I died, I'd be known as that woman who faked her death and framed her husband. You remember. You remember. I can't allow it. Hours later, I am still awake, thinking in the dark. When my door rattles, a gentle bang, Jeff's bang. I debate, then open it, ready to apologize for my rudeness before. He's tugging on his beard, staring at my doormat, then looks up with amber eyes. Dorothy said you were looking for work, he said. Yeah, I, I guess. I am. I got something tonight, pay you fifty bucks. Amy Elliott Dunn wouldn't leave her cabin for fifty bucks, but Lydia and or Nancy needs work. I have to say yes. Couple of hours, fifty dollars, he shrugs. Doesn't make any difference to me, just thought I'd offer. What is it? Fishing. Well, this is interesting. This isn't um this isn't in the movie at all. This is a whole fishing subplot that like <laughs> is not a character trait of Jeff in the movie. I was positive Jeff would drive a pickup, but he guides me to a shiny Ford hatchback. A heartbreaking car. The car of the new college grad with big plans and a modest budget. Not the car a grown man should be driving. I am wearing my swimsuit under my sundress, as instructed. Not the bikini, the full one. The one you can really swim in, Jeff intoned. I never noticed him anywhere near the pool. But he knew my swimwear cold, which was flattering and alarming at the same time. He leaves the windows down as we drive through the forested hills, the gravel dust coating my stubby hair. Feels like something from a country music video. The girl in the sundress leaning out to catch the breeze of a red state summer night. I can see stars. Jeff hums off and on. He parks down the road from a restaurant that hangs out on stilts over the lake, a barbecue place known for its giant souvenir cups of boozy drinks with bad names, gator juice, and bass mouth blitz. I would try I would try and get your juice. <laughs> you can't trust them, Amy. Kill them all. <laughs> or frame them for murder. <laughs> and that's her go-to now. Let's see. Gator juice. I know this from the discarded cups that float along the shores of the lake. Cracked and neon-colored with the restaurant's logo, Catfish Carl's. Catfish Carl's has a deck that overhangs the water. Diners can load up on handfuls of kitty kibble from the crank machines and drop them into the gaping mouths of hundreds of giant catfish that wait below. Kitty kibble, because they're catfish. That's cute. What exactly are we doing here, Jeff? You net them, I kill them. He gets out of the car, and I follow him around to the hatchback which is filled with coolers. We put them in here, on ice, resell them. Hmm. Uh, resell them? Who buys stolen fish? Jeff smiles that lazy cat smile. I got a clientele of sorts. And then I realize, he isn't a Grizzly Adams guitar-playing, peace-loving granola guy at all. He is a redneck thief who wants to believe that he's more complicated than that. He pulls out a net, a box of nine lives, and a stained plastic bucket. Uh, that's interesting. Nine lives, I guess it's... I would assume it's a cat food. Do you actually give kitty kibble to catfish? I didn't know that. Well, they are ha half cat. <laughs> I have absolutely no intention of being part of this illicit peace sign economy, but I, quote-unquote, am fairly interested. How many women can say they were part of a fish smuggling ring? I am game. I have become game again since I died. All the things I disliked or feared, all the limits I had, they've slid off me. I can do pretty much anything. A ghost has that freedom. We walk down the hill under the deck of Catfish Carl's and onto the docks, which floats, slur uh, sl which floats slurpily on the wakes of a passing motorboat. Jimmy Buffett blaring. Jeff hands me a net. We need this to be quick. You just jump in the water, scoop the net in, nab the fish, then tilt the net up to me. It'll be heavy, though, and squirmy, so be prepared. And don't scream or nothing. I won't scream, but I don't want to go in the water. I can do it from the deck. You should take off your dress. At least, you'll ruin it. I'm okay. He looks annoyed for a moment. He's the boss, I'm the employee, 
and so far I'm not listening to him. But then he turns around modestly and tugs off his shirt and hands me the box of cat food without fully facing me, as if he's shy. I hold the box with its narrow mouth over the water, and immediately a hundred shiny arched backs roll toward me, a mob of serpents, the tails cutting across the surface furiously, and then the mouths are below me, the fish roiling over each other to swallow the pellets, and then, like trained pets, aiming their faces up toward me for more. I scoop the net into the middle of the pack and sit down hard on the dock to get leverage to pull the harvest up. When I yank, the net is full of half a dozen whiskery, slick catfish, all frantically trying to get back in the water, their gaping lips opening and shutting between the squares of nylon, their collective tugging making the net wobble up and down. Lift it up! Lift it up, girl! I push a knee below the net's handle and let it dangle there. <clears throat> Pardon me. Jeff reaching in, grabbing a fish with two hands, each encased in terry cloth manicure gloves for a better grip. He moves his hands down the trail, then swings the fish like a crudgel, smashing its head on the side of the dock. Blood explodes. A brief, sharp pelt of it streaks across my legs. A hard chunk of <laughs> a hard chunk of meat hits my hair. Jeff throws the fish in the bucket and grabs another with assembly line smoothness. Let's go check this real quick. That's nice. My friends have been uh, checking up on me in quarantine. We work in grunts and wheezes for half an hour, four nets full, until my arm turns rubbery and the ice chests are full. Jeff takes the empty pail and fills it with water from the lake, pours it across the messy entrails and into the fish pens. The catfish gobble up the guts of their fallen brethren. The dock is left clean. Pours one last pail of water across our bloody feet. Why do you have to smash them? I ask. Can't stand to watch something suffer, he says. Quick dunk? I'm okay, he's, I say. Not in my car, you're not. Come on, quick dunk. You have more crap on you than you realize. We run off the dock toward the rocky beach nearby. While I wade ankle-deep in the water, Jeff runs with giant splashy footsteps and throws himself forward, arms wild. As soon as he's far enough out, I unhook my money belt and fold my sundress around it, leave it at the water's edge with my glasses on top. I lower myself until I feel the warm water hit my thighs, my belly, and my neck, and then I hold my breath and go under. I swim far and fast, stay underwater longer than I should to remind myself what it would feel like to drown. I know I could do it if I needed to, and when I come up with a single discipled gasp, I see Jeff lapping rapidly toward shore, and I have to swim fast as I porpoise back to my money belt and scramble onto the rocks just ahead of him. This wasn't what I expected from the trip, honestly. Yeah, I uh, I thought he was gonna like steal the the, the money. Yeah. Mm. Nick done. Eight days gone. As soon as I hung up with Tommy, I phoned Hillary Handy if my murder of Amy was a lie and Tommy O'Hara's rape of Amy was a lie. Why not Hillary Handy's stalking of Amy? A sociopath must cut her teeth somewhere like the austere marble halls of Wichar Academy. When she picked up, I blurted, This is Nick Dunn, Amy Elliott's husband. I really need to talk to you. Why? I really, really need some information about your... Don't say friendship. I heard an angry grin in her voice. No, I wouldn't. I just want to hear your side. I am not calling because I think you've got anything, anything to do with my wife, her situation, currently, but I would really like to hear what happened. The truth, because I think you may be able to shed light on a pattern of behavior of Amy's. What kind of pattern? When very bad things happen to people who upset her. She breathed heavily into the phone. Two days ago, I wouldn't have talked to you, she started. 
But then I was having a drink with some friends, and the TV was on, and you came on. And it was about Amy being pregnant. Everyone I was with, they were so angry at you. They hated you. And I thought, I know how that feels. Because she's not dead, right? I mean, she's still just... She's still just missing. No body. That's right. So let me tell you about Amy and high school and what happened. Hold on. On her end, I could hear cartoons playing, rubbery voices and calliope music. Then suddenly not. Then whining, no then whining voices. Go watch downstairs. Downstairs, please. So freshman year, I'm the kid from Memphis. Everyone else is East Coast, I swear. It felt weird. Different, you know? All the girls at Wickshire, it was like they'd been raised communally. The lingo, the clothes, the hair. And it wasn't like I was a pariah. I was just insecure, for sure. Amy was already the girl. Like, first day, I remember everyone knew her. Everyone was talking about her. She was amazing Amy. We all, we'd all read those books growing up. Plus, she was just gorgeous. I mean, she was... Yeah, I know. Right. And... Pretty soon, she was showing an interest in me, like taking me under her wing or whatever. She had this joke that she was amazing Amy, so I was her sidekick, Susie, and she started calling me Susie, and pretty soon everyone else did too, which was fine by me. I mean, I was a little toady. Get Amy a drink if she was thirsty, throw in a load of laundry if she needed clean underwear. Hold on. Again, I could hear the shuffle of her hair against the receiver. Mary Beth had brought every Elliot photo album with her in case we needed more pictures. She showed me a photo of Amy and Hillary, cheek-to-cheek -cheek grins, so I could picture Hillary now, the same butter blonde hair as my wife, framing a plainer face with muddy hazel eyes. Jason, I am on the phone. Just give them a few popsicles. It's not that dang hard. Sorry. Our kids are out of school, and my husband never, ever takes care of them. So he seems a little confused about what to do for the ten minutes I'm on the phone with you. Sorry. So. So, right. I was little Susie, and we had this game going. And for a few months, August, September, October, it was great. Like, intense friendship. We were together all the time. And then a few weird things happened at once that I knew kind of bothered her. What? A guy from our brother's school. He meets us both at the fall dance, and the next day he calls me instead of Amy which I'm sure he did because Amy was too intimidating, but whatever. And then a few days later, our midterm grades come in and mine are slightly better, like 4.1 versus 4.0. And not long after, one of our friends, she invites me to spend Thanksgiving with her family. Me, not Amy. Again, I'm sure this was because Amy intimidated people. She wasn't easy to be around. You felt all the time like you had to impress. But I can feel things change just a little. I can tell she's really irritated, even though she doesn't admit it. Instead, she starts getting me to do things. I don't realize it at the time, but she starts setting me up. She asks if she can color my hair the same blonde as hers, because mine's mousy, and it'll look so nice, a brighter shade. And she starts complaining about her parents. I mean, she's always complained about her parents. But now she really gets going on them. How they only love her as an idea and not really for who she is, so she says she wants to mess with her parents. She has me start prank calling her house, telling her parents I'm the new amazing Amy. We take the train into New York some weekends and she'd tell me to stand outside their house. One time she had me run up to her mom and tell her I was going to get rid of Amy and be her new Amy or some crap like that. And you did it? It was just dumb stuff girls do. Back before cell phones and cyberbullying, a way to kill time. We did prank stuff like that all the time, just dumb stuff. Try to one-up each other on how daring and freaky we could be. Then what? Then she starts distancing herself. She gets cold, and I think... I think she doesn't like me anymore. Girls at school start looking at me funny. I'm shut, I'm shut out of the cool circle. Fine. But then one day I'm called in to see the headmistress. Amy has had a horrible accident. Twisted ankle, fractured arm, cracked ribs. Amy has fallen down this long set of stairs, and she says it was me who pushed her. Hold on. Go back downstairs now. Go. Downstairs. Go downstairs. Sorry, I'm back. Never have kids. So, Amy said you pushed her, I asked. 
Yeah, because I was crazy. I was obsessed with her, and I wanted to be Susie. And then being Susie wasn't enough. I had to be Amy. And she had all this evidence that she'd had me create over the past few months. Her parents obviously had seen me lurking around the house. I theoretically accosted her mom. My hair dyed blonde, and the clothes I'd bought that matched Amy's. Clothes I bought while shopping with her, but I couldn't prove that. All her friends came in, explained how Amy for the past month had been so frightened of me. All this shit. I looked totally insane. Completely insane. Her parents got a restraining order on me. And I kept swearing it wasn't me. But by then I was so miserable that I wanted to leave school anyway. So we didn't fight the expulsion. I wanted to get away from her by that time. I mean, the girl cracked her own ribs. I was scared. This little 15-year-old, she pulled this off. Fooled her friends, parents, teachers... And this was all because of a boy and some grades and a Thanksgiving invitation? A about a month after I moved back to Memphis, I got a letter. It wasn't signed, it was typed, but it was obviously Amy. It was a list of all the ways I'd let her down. Crazy stuff. Forgot to wait for me after English. Twice. Forgot I am allergic to strawberries. Twice. Jesus. But I feel like the real reason wasn't even on there. What was the real reason? I feel like Amy wanted people to believe she really was perfect. And as we got to be friends, I got to know her. That she wasn't perfect. You know, she was brilliant and charming and all that, but she was also controlling and OCD and a drama queen and a bit of a liar, which was fine by me. It just wasn't fine by her. She got rid of me because I knew she wasn't perfect. It made me wonder about you. About me? Why? Friends see most of each other's flaws. Spouses see every awful last bit. If she punished a friend of a few months by throwing herself down a flight of stairs, what would she do to a man who was dumb enough to marry her? Ooh, that's a really good paragraph about her. Two, 292. Um, yeah, that Amy isn't perfect, and that's fine for other people, but it's not okay with her. <laughs> that is super interesting. <laughs> Dumb enough, lol. Yeah. <laughs> I hung up as one of Hillary's kids picked up the second extension and began singing a nursery rhyme. I immediately phoned Tanner and relayed my conversations with Hillary and Tommy. So we have a couple of stories. Great, Tanner said. This will really be great. In a way that told me it wasn't that great. Have you heard from Andy? I hadn't. I'm one of my people waiting for her at her apartment building, he said. Discreet. I didn't know you had people. What we really need is to find Amy, he said, ignoring me. Girl like that, I can't imagine she'd be able to hide, to stay hidden for too long. You have any thoughts? I kept picturing her on a posh hotel balcony near the ocean, wrapped in a white robe, thick as a rug, sipping a very good mo uh, montrage, while she tracked my ruin on the internet, on cable, in the tabloids. While she enjoyed the endless co coverage and ex exult exultation of Amy Elliot Dunn, attending her own funeral, I wondered if she was self-aware enough to realize she'd stolen a page from Mark Twain. I picture her near the ocean, I said. Then I stopped, feeling like a boardwalk psychic. No, I have no ideas. She could literally be anywhere. I don't think we'll see her unless she decides to come back. That seems unlikely, Tanner breathed, annoyed. So let's uh, try to find Andy and see where Ed is. We're running out of wiggle room here. Then it was dinner time, and then the sun set, and I was alone again in my haunted house. I was thinking about all of Amy's lies and whether the pregnancy was one of them. I'd done the math. Amy and I had sex sporadically enough it was possible. But then she would know I'd do the math. Truth or lie? If it was a lie, it was designed to gut me. I'd always assumed that Amy and I would have children. It was one of the reasons I knew I would marry Amy. Because I pictured us having kids together. 
I remember the first time I imagined it. It's not two months after we began dating. I was walking from my apartment in Kipps Bay to a favorite pocket, uh, to a favorite pocket park along the East River. A path that took me past the giant Lego block of the United Nations headquarters. The flags of myriad countries fluttering in the wind. A kid would like this, I thought. All the different colors, the busy memory game of matching each flag to its country. There's Finland and there's New Zealand. The one-eyed smile of Mauritia, Maurit, Mauritania. Never seen that word before. And then I realized it wasn't a kid, but our kid, mine and Amy's, who would like this. Our kid, sprawled on the floor with an old encyclopedia, just like I'd done. But our kid wouldn't be alone. I'd be sprawled next to him. Aiding him in his budding vexa... vexa... I'm learning so many new words today. Vex... Vexalala... Vexalalology? Yeah. It's two. It's an L-O-L-O-G-Y. Vexavelalology. Well, I don't know what that means. Which sounds less like a study of flags. Well, there we go. Uh, which sounds less like a study of flags than a study in annoyance, which would have suited my father's attitude toward me, but not mine toward my son's. I pictured Amy joining us on the floor, flat on her stomach, her feet kicked up in the air, pointing out Palau, the yellow dot just left of center on the crisp blue background, which I was sure would be her favorite. From then on, the boy was real, and sometimes a girl, but mostly a boy. He was inevitable. I suffered from regular, insistent paternal aches. Months after the wedding, I had a strange moment in front of the medicine cabinet, floss between my teeth, when I thought, she wants kids, right? I should ask. Of course I should ask. When I posed the question, roundabout, vague, she said, Of course, of course, some day. But every morning she still perched in front of the sink and swallowed her pill. For three years she did this every morning, while I fluttered near the topic, but failed to actually say the words, I want us to have a baby. After the layoffs, it seemed like it might happen. Suddenly there was an uncontestable, uncontestable space in our lives. And one day, over breakfast... Amy looked up from her toast and said, I'm off the pill. Just like that. She was off the pill three months and nothing happened. And not long after the move to Missouri, she made an appointment for us to start the medical intervention. Once Amy started a project, she didn't like to dilly-dally. We'll tell them we've been trying a year, she said. Foolishly, I agreed. We were barely ever touching each other by then, but we still thought a kid made sense. Sure, You'll have to do your part, too, you know, she said on the drive to St. Louis. You'll have to give semen. I know. Why do you say it like that? I just figured you'd be too proud, self-conscious, and proud. I was a rather nasty cocktail of both those traits, but at the fertility center, I dutifully entered the strange small room dedicated to self-abuse, a place where hundreds of men had entered for no other reason, uh, for no other purpose than to crank the shank, Clean the rifle, jerk the gherkin, make the bald man cry, pound the flounder, sail the mayonnaise seas, wiggle the walrus, whitewash with Tom and Huck. I sometimes use humor as self-defense. Um, Self-conscious and proud is a good description of Nick. 294. It's funny because I have these notes. I don't know if they'll actually go in the final product of the movie or the, the, the video that I'm making on this, but it's good to have more information than less. The room contained a vinyl-covered armchair, a TV, and a table that held a grab bag of porn and a box of tissues. The porn was early 90s, judging from the woman's hair. Yes, top and bottom. And the action was mid midcore. Another good essay. Who selects the porn for fertility centers? Who judges what will get men off, yet not be too degrading to all the women outside the cum room, the nurses and doctors and hopeful hormone-addled wives? Cum room is just awful, but I love it. It's a... <laughs> this is the cum room. It's my bedroom. Um... 
<laughs> you're on a date. You're on a date with someone, and you're having dinner, and then you're like, would you like to retire to the cum room? Don't like it. I, uh, <laughs> I visited the room on three separate occasions. They like to have a lot of backup, while Amy did nothing. She was supposed to begin taking pills, but she didn't, and then she didn't some more. She was the one who'd be pregnant, the one who'd turn over her body to the baby, so I postponed nudging her for a few months, keeping an eye on the pill bottle to see if the level went down. Finally, after a few beers one winter night, I crunched up the steps to our home, shed my snow-crusted clothes, and curled up next to her in bed, my face near her shoulder, breathing her in, warming the tip of my nose on her skin. I whispered the words, Let's do this, Amy, let's have a baby. And she said no. I was expecting nervousness, caution, worry. Nick, will I be a good mom? But I got a clipped cold no. A no without loopholes. Nothing dramatic, no big deal, just not something she was interested in anymore. Because I realized I'd be stuck doing all the hard stuff, she reasoned. All the diapers and doctor's appointments and discipline and you just breeze in and be fun daddy. I'd do all the work to make them good people and you'd undo it anyway and they'd love you and hate me. I told Amy it wasn't true, but she didn't believe me. I told her I didn't just want a child, I needed a child. Uh, I mean, you've... This is true. This is very true, Nick. Like, you wouldn't even take care of your mom or dad. Your mom needed you, and, and Amy ended up taking care of her the entire time. And then she died. So, that's fair. This is like... Let me put 295. Because... Because it's kind of like getting a kid a, a goldfish uh, to make sure they can take care of a dog. And you couldn't even do that. There's barely... Uh, Nick. I needed a child. I had to know I could love a person unconditionally. That I could make a little creature feel uh, constantly welcome and wanted no matter what that I could be a different kind of father than my dad was, that I could raise a boy who wasn't like me. I begged her. Amy remained unmoved. A year later, I got a notice in the mail. The clinic would dispose of my semen unless they heard from us. I left a letter on the dining room table, an open rebuke. Three days later, I saw it in the trash. That was our final communication on the subject. Yeah, he'd love his kid until it became an inconvenience. Exactly, yeah. Uh, so it's all about him somehow needing a kid when someone else has to do the heavy lifting. Exactly. It's it's He wants something until he can't play with it anymore. That's good. I want to write that down. Also, the fact that even the baby is a means to an end to make him feel accomplished. That's a really good point also. Yeah. It's so... It's so very Nick. He's like, I need, I need this to prove I'm a good guy. <laughs> By then, I'd already been secretly dating Andy for months, so I had no right to be upset. <laughs> yeah, Nick, oh my god. But that didn't stop my aching, and it didn't stop me from daydreaming about our boy, mine and Amy's. I'd gotten attached to him. The fact was, Amy and I would make a great child. I think you'd make the worst child. I feel like you two would make the worst child possible. <laughs> The marionettes were watching me with alarmed black eyes. I peered out my window, saw that the news truck had packed it in, so I went out in the warm 
in the warm night. Time to walk. Maybe a lone tabloid writer was trailing me. If so, I didn't care. I headed through our complex, then 45 minutes out along River Road, then onto the highway that shot right through the middle of Carthage. Thirty loud, fumy minutes past car dealerships with trucks displayed appealingly like desserts, past fast food chains and liquor stores and mini marts and gas stations, until I reached the turnoff for downtown. I had encountered not a single other person on foot the entire time, only faceless blurs whizzing past me in cars. Their child would 100% be a school shooter. <laughs> oh, 100%. would just be just... Because when you combine Amy's... Um, what's the word? Evil genius, I guess? Combined with Nick's self-entitled self ass and hatred of women... That's how you make a school shooter. Yeah, it would not be good. Um, yeah, just the worst child. You would just make the worst child. <laughs> just the worst child possible. What was that actual quote? It was... The fact was, Amy and I would make a great child. Ugh. They just straight up produce the Antichrist, Lemay. <laughs> That'd be so funny. Yeah, no, just that's um I didn't finish good omens, but that's just good omens. They just make let's make the worst child. It was close to midnight. I passed the bar, tempted to go in, but put off by the crowds. A reporter or two had to be camped out in there. It's what I would do. But I wanted to be in a bar. I wanted to be surrounded by people having fun blowing off steam. I walked another, f another 15 minutes to the other end of downtown to a cheesier, rowdier, younger bar where the bathrooms were always laced with vomit on Saturday nights. It was a bar that Andy's crowd would go to, and perhaps, who knew, drag along uh, dr uh, and perhaps, who knew, drag along Andy. It would be a nice bit of luck to see her there. At least gauge her mood from across the room. And if she wasn't there, then I'd have a fucking drink. But what would be bad uh, if the kid was excellent and worse if the kid was mediocre? What would be bad is if the kid was excellent and worse if the child was mediocre. <laughs> yeah, it's like, what's... Uh, you have an expectation to be... You have to be the worst child. It's just... <laughs> I went as deep into the bar as I could. No Andy, no Andy. My face was partially covered by a baseball cap. Even so, I felt a few pings as I moved past crowds of drinkers, heads abruptly turning toward me the wide eyes of identification. That guy, right? Mid-July. I wondered if I'd become so nefarious come October. I'd be some frat boy's tasteless Halloween costume. Mop of blonde hair, an amazing Amy book tucked under an armpit. Ooh. <laughs> Go said she'd received half a dozen phone calls asking if the bar had an official t-shirt for sale. We didn't, thank God. Yeah, that would that would for sure be a, a some boy's tasteless Halloween costume. I sat down and ordered a scotch from the bartender, a guy about my age who stared at me a bit too long, deciding whether he would serve me. He finally, grudgingly, set down a small tumbler in front of me, his nostrils flared. When I got out my wallet, he aimed an alarmed palm up at me. I do not want your money, man. Not at all. I left cash anyway. Asshole. When I tried to flag him for another drink, he glanced my way, shook his head, and leaned in toward the woman he was chatting up. A few seconds later, she discreetly looked toward me, pretending she was stretching. Her mouth turned down as she nodded, That's him, Nick Dunn. The bartender never came back. You can't yell. You can't star strong arm. Hey, jackass, will you give me a, a goddamn drink or what? You can't be the asshole they believe you are. You just have to sit and take it. But I wasn't leaving. I sat with my empty glass in front of me and pretended I was thinking very hard. I checked my disposable cell just in case Andy had called. No. 
Then I pulled out my real phone and played a round of solitaire, pretending to be engrossed. My wife had done this to me, turned me into a man who couldn't get a drink in his own hometown. God, I hated her. Was it scotch? A girl about Andy's age was standing in front of me. Asian, black, shoulder-length hair. Cubicle cute. Excuse me? What were you drinking? Scotch? Yeah. Having trouble getting... She was gone. To the, end of the, uh, to the end of the bar, and she was nosing into the bartender's line of vision with a big "help me" smile. A girl used to make a girl used to making her presence known, and then she was back with a scotch in an actual big boy tumbler. Take it, she nudged, and I did. Cheers. She held up her own clear fizzing drink. We clinked glasses. Can I sit? I'm not staying long, actually. I looked around, making sure no one was aiming a camera phone at us. So, okay, she said with a shruggy smile. I can pretend I don't know you're Nick Dunn, but I'm not going to insult you. I'm rooting for you, by the way. You've been getting a bad rap. Thanks. It's, uh, it's a weird time. I'm serious. You know how in court they talk about the CSI effect? Hello, little cat. Well, you're fine. Well, hello. Yeah, hi, baby. Yes, you're very sweet. Hello. I'm in the middle of something. Okay. Can I can I keep reading? Jeez. <laughs> okay. You should shoot. Ah. Like everyone on the jury has watched so much CSI. Oh, sweetie. Yeah, hello. Are you going to sit down? What are you doing? Oh, a little stretchy foot. Okay. Well, can you sit down so I can keep reading? Yeah, she's very cute. Nice. Look at her little face. You're just a little weird baby. Tiny feet. Everything about you is so small. Oh, yes, it is. You have teeny tiny little paws and a tiny little cat skull. I'm gonna keep reading, okay? Can you just... Can you chill? <laughs> just, just sit there, okay? Meow, meow, meow. <laughs> Small AF. The Rainbow 69 is very good. Dude, yeah, you subbed to uh, Bailey to get that Rainbow 69. It's really good, huh? I made her new uh, Twitch stream layout, so hopefully she'll be using that soon. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see. I'm serious. You know how in court they talk about the CSI effect? Like everyone on the jury has watched so much CSI that they believe science can prove anything? Yeah. Well, I think there's an evil husband effect. Everyone has seen too many true crime shows where the husband is always, always the killer, so people automatically assume the husband's the bad guy. That's exactly it, I said. Thank you. That is exactly it. And Ellen Abbott, fuck Ellen Abbott. My new friend said. <laughs> she is a one woman, walking, talking, man hating perversion of the justice system. She raised her glass again. What's your name? I asked. Another Scotch? That's a gorgeous name. This character is not in the movie, so I'm very curious about this. Her name, as it turned out, was Rebecca. She had a ready credit card and a hollow leg. Another, another, another? She was from Muscatine, Iowa, another Mississippi River town, and had moved to New York after undergrad to be a writer, also like me. She'd been an editorial assistant at three different magazines, a bridal magazine, a working mom magazine, a teen girl magazine, all of which had shuddered in the past few years. So she was now working for a crime blog called Who Done It, and she was, giggle, 
in town to try to get an interview with me. Hell, I had to love her hungry kid chutzpah. Just fly me to Carthage. The major networks haven't gotten him, but I'm sure I can. I've been waiting outside your house with the rest of the world, and then at the police station, and then I decided I needed a drink. And here you walk in. It's just too perfect. Too weird, right? She said. She had little gold hoop earrings that she kept playing with, her hair tucked behind her ears. I should go, I said. My words were sticky around the edges, the beginnings of a slur. But you never told me why you're here, Rebecca said. I have to say, it takes a lot of courage, I think, for you to head out without a friend or some sort of backup. I bet you get a lot of shitty looks. I shrugged. No big deal. People judging everything you do without even knowing you. Like you with the cell phone photo at the park. I mean, you were probably like me. You were raised to be polite. But no one wants the real story. They just want to... Gotcha. You know? I'm just tired of people judging me because I fit into a certain mold. She raised her eyebrows. Her earrings jittered. I thought of Amy sitting in her mystery control center, wherever the fuck she was... Judging me from every angle, finding me wanting, even from afar. Was there anything she could see that would make her call off this madness? Oh, yeah. Khaleesi just stretched out. Don't talk to that girl, Nick. Yeah, I know. This is, um... This has to be a trap of some kind. I mean... I went on. I mean, people think we were in a rocky marriage, but actually, right before she disappeared, she put together a treasure hunt for me. Amy would want one of two things. For me to learn my lesson and fry like the bad boy I was, or for me to learn my lesson and love her the way she deserved and be a good, obedient, chastised, dickless little boy. This wonderful treasure hunt. I smiled. Rebecca shook her head with a little V frown. My wife, she always did a treasure hunt for her anniversary. One clue leads to a special place where I find the next clue, and so on. Amy, I tried to get my eyes to fill, settled for wiping them. The clock above the door read 12.37 a.m. Before she went missing, she hid all the clues for this year. Before she disappeared on your anniversary? Oh, before, it, there's no question. Before she disappeared on your anniversary. And it's been all that's kept me together. It made me feel closer to her. Rebecca pulled out a flip camera. Let me interview you. On camera. Bad idea. I'll give it context, she said. That's exactly what you need, Nick. I swear. Context. You need it bad. Come on, just a few words. I shook my head. Too dangerous. Say what you just said. I'm serious, Nick. I'm the opposite of Ellen Abbott. The anti-Ellen Abbott. You need me in your life. She held up the camera, its tiny red light eyeing me. Seriously, turn it off. Help a girl out. I get the Nick Dunn interview. My career is made. You've done your good deed for the year. Please? No harm, Nick. One minute. Just one minute. I swear I will only make you look good. She motioned, she motioned to a nearby booth where we'd be tucked out of view of any gawkers. I nodded and we resettled. That little red light aimed at me the whole time. What do you want to know? I asked. Tell me about the treasure hunt. It sounds romantic. Like, quirky, awesome, romantic. Take control of the story, Nick. For both the capital P public and the capital C wife. Right now, I thought, I am a man who loves his wife and will find her. I am a man who loves his wife, and I am the good guy. I am the one to root for. I am a man who isn't perfect, but my wife is, and I will be very, very obedient from now on. I could do this more easily than feign sadness. Like I said, I can operate in sunlight. Still, I felt my throat tighten as I got ready to say the words. My wife, she just happens to be the coolest girl I've ever met. How many guys can say that? I married the coolest girl I ever met. You fucking bitch, you fucking bitch, you fucking bitch. Come home so I can kill you. <laughs> Oof. It's great how that's written, because you fucking bitch is written one, two, three. Okay, I did it the right amount of times. Um, just from being a voice actor and just from reading so much copy all the time, you 
can kind of get a rhythm and accurately guess how many times something is said, even when it, there's no spaces in between the words, when it's one of those, you fucking bitch, you fucking bitch, you fucking bitch. I can just like eyeball it and be like, that's probably three. I should give it three because four would be too much and two isn't enough. Um, and your instincts are just correct because I've been doing this for uh, 11, 12 years and you, and you kind of just gain that understanding. Um, but it's... Oof. <laughs> Interesting, because this character is not in the movie, but there's an event that happens in the movie that I have a feeling isn't in the book. So they might be just subbing in this interview for that, which is an interesting choice. I wonder why they made that choice. Um, God, do I want to keep going? I want to keep going, but I think I shouldn't. Because my voice is a little, you know. Let's, uh, let's pack it in for the day. That sounds good. Yeah. But, uh, thank you all for, for coming. And this is good because I, I, I like that the first part of the book, we're, we're starting with, uh, Nick chapters. And now with the second part, uh, we start with Amy chapters. But thank you so much. <laughs> I'm slurring in real life. Uh, I was playing drunk Nick, so I'm, you kind of gain like a little lethargicness to the mouth. Um, thank y'all so much. This has been super fun. Today is Thursday, technically Friday. When is my next stream? Let me check because I have a party, online party, uh, that I'm going to. Oh, no worries, Cucumber. You're all good. Um, yeah, I'm streaming. I'm not streaming on Saturday. I usually have been streaming once every two days. But um, we're rescheduling that to Sunday because it is the Living Tombstone's birthday. My friend Yoav. Uh, I think it was his birthday last week. And now we're having like a virtual party for him, um, which is great. I miss all my buds. I miss Yoav. He's a good, sweet, sweet boy. Uh, we're gonna play Jackbox and just fuck around. Um, and I might have my first drink that I've had in a while. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah. Looking forward to Sunday. Awesome! I'm really glad people are enjoying these streams, because um, I'm really enjoying reading this book. I'm getting such a new perspective uh, than I had before. You know, uh, Amy is much easier... To, uh, I shouldn't even say that. Amy, the first... The first couple times that I saw the movie Gone Girl, I was uh, Nick was the protagonist to me. Then as I got older and understood how men can fuck up your lives, I was a little more leaning towards, well, I guess, Amy, I can understand her going insane from this perspective. But now reading book Amy, I'm not on her side anymore. I'm like, oh, no, she has gone insane. And, I, and I, I'm finding myself less relating to her the crazier she gets uh so this has been very interesting first drink in a while is that since valentine's you know what it might be or you know what i i, I drink um i only drink socially i have alcohol in the house but it's usually for like if someone comes over and honestly i don't think i've ever had anyone over and given them a drink i think i keep i keep it around just for in case uh, I think my last drink that I had was a couple weeks before quarantine, because I went out with some friends, and we were barely out, but I, I did have one drink, and we hung out for a bit. Uh, I think that must have been the last time, so it's, I had a drink after Valentine's, but it was barely, uh... <laughs> They've been really entertaining. Thank you for streaming. Oh, thank you. I'm, uh, thank you. I really appreciate that. <laughs> That's just because you're a white male. It is. It is. Because I'm, I'm gaining perspective. Women are all crazy. <laughs> well, doesn't it make it more interesting if neither main character is a protagonist? Uh, yes. That's a very good way of putting it. Um, yeah, it's, it's. Now there is, 
<laughs> sorry, I have to I have to close out of my Twitch browser because I keep seeing a tiny picture of myself and it's fucking with me. But yeah, that's that's uh it's cool reading the book and neither one both of them are in the wrong in different ways and it's uh that's a lot more interesting to me uh than the movie. So we've kind of gone from this Nick is in the right to Amy is in the right to I've never I've never truly believed Amy has 100% been in the right. Uh the movie doesn't portray her as mentally ill as it does in the book. Uh because, like, she's very insane in the book. And, yeah, it's... <laughs> it's interesting to go from that to that to... Eh, they're both kind of fucked up people. I'm on neither party side, but if I had to choose one to hate, Amy's not making it easier to choose Nick. Yeah, I'm, I'm finding it's the crazy... Like, Amy's just, like, descending into full-on fucking madness. The more that I hear about her fucking up other people's lives, the more I'm like, oh no. <laughs> you don't like tiny pics of yourself? <laughs> there I am, teeny tiny. I'm so glad that um, my shirtless Kylo emotes got approved. Like, I honestly wasn't expecting them to, and they look very funny and very cute. You have a superior version? What is it? Oh, do I have a little eye patch? I can't tell. Do I have little, like little sunglasses or like a little eye patch? What if Kylo had an eye patch? It's so cool that you can like put things on emotes. A squish. Oh, you squish. You squish Khaleesi. It's the Khaleesi emote, but it's like, it's squished. <laughs> sunglasses. Yeah, I see it now. Hell yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I will be much more into wearing sunglasses um, once I get LASIK. I'm very excited about... I'm, I'm, I'm trying to save up money for LASIK because at first, it's a weird thing. It's a weird thing being so depressed that you think that you're not going to live past a certain age. Because for the longest time, I didn't know that I was trans, but I just knew that I was just depressed all the time. And I was like, I'm probably going to kill myself before I'm 30. Uh, but now with this new lease on life where I am like transitioned and comfortable with myself, I've started thinking about the future and I'm writing my show. I'm working towards getting phalloplasty. And this whole time I was like, I'm not going to bother paying money to get my eyes unfucked. Um, because I guess I didn't care that much about myself. I didn't care about the level of discomfort I suffer because of my eyes, because a lot of people don't know how fucked up my eyes are. My eyes are extremely bad. Uh, even with glasses, I can't read things on the board. Like at school, you know, we would try to get my eyes, um, we, we, we would try to get the prescription to be strong enough that I could read the board, uh, but some things were so tiny that I couldn't. And we tried to increase it so it, I had a stronger prescription, but then it would give me headaches. So I kind of just have settled into this, like, you know, um, I don't know, no, I don't know what my prescription is right now off the top of my head to tell you. And that might not mean a lot to some people, but I'm always that person that like you switch glasses with people or people with good vision are like, let me see your glasses to see how bad your eyesight is. They, they do this and immediately are like, nope, can't do it. And then they just give them right back to me. My eyesight is terrible um my hand in front of my face just to like show you a perspective um if my hand is this close to my face i can see it i can still see it now but it hurts to look at my hand is blurry when it gets to here like that's not comfortable for me to look at and then the farther it gets away the more blurry it gets like my vision is completely fucked uh, and it keeps changing, so we have to wait until it stabilizes, which should be around this age. Um, so I'm, and I, I've gotten my the thickness checked of my cornea, so I am able to. I'm a candidate for LASIK. We just have to wait until you know uh, my eyes settle, so that they can do the operation and not, you know, for example, if my eyes change a year from now, like. Do I have to go back in? What'll happen with that? They want to make sure that it's a, a good investment for me. 
Um, so I've seriously considered getting it because my glasses, I have to clean them like five times a day. I can't see in the shower. I can't see during sex, which also is not good for my dysphoria. Um, so I've thought about like, you know what? I, uh, I have a consistent job. I'm getting around 200 bucks from Patreon every month. What if I try to save up and get my eyes fixed? And that's been very, very exciting to me. Uh, so I think I'm going to do it. So that's very exciting. Look, you're, you're as white as Kylo now. Yes, squished. Squished Kylo. <laughs> I love that, like, the, 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 the pose. <laughs> Mom said it's my turn on the Xbox. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, the future looks bright. I'm working on my shit. I, I have a game plan for the future that I'm very excited about right now. My plan right now, I said right now twice, right now, my plan right now, as is right now is to right now finish writing my show. When quarantine lifts, I want to get everything finished with it of season one, like confirm I have someone in mind that I want to co-direct it with me. Um, I have someone that I want to look over the scripts to make sure that they are A-OK. -okay. Uh, just shoot it, get my eyes fixed. Once everything is shot for season one, I can get phalloplasty. And uh, then I can start working on season two. And then conquer the world. Hey, I'm fucking proud of you. Don't you ever fucking forget it. Thank you, Kikabra. I appreciate that. <laughs> is your show going to be a live action? Yes. Uh, yeah, it's going to be live action. Which is why I need to uh, get season one done before I get Fallow. Because my character that I'm going to be playing is, is uh, a senior in high school. And doesn't have phalloplasty yet. And when I get phalloplasty, I'm going to have a scar on my left arm. Probably going from here to down here. And I'm also probably going to be having a scar on my leg somewhere uh, because they take that skin. They take the skin from the arm to make my party dick. And then um, you need skin to put on your arm to, you know, your skin, need, your, your, your arm needs skin. So they take it from another place to put on there. Uh, and it's going to take some time because I also need to get like hair removal and stuff done. Um, because there's, uh, hair that, that grows on your skin, on your arm, obviously, and they want to, it takes a year, they usually recommend to, to get sessions to remove, uh, hair so that my dick does not grow hair, which I don't, wouldn't want that. I don't want to shave my dick, <laughs> at least not there. Um, so I need to get season one totally done before, uh, before I get surgery, you know, and that also gives me time to, uh, to put between my two fundraisers, you know, cause I raised money for my top surgery and I don't want to just go right into like, <laughs> can you give me money again? Cause I feel very shitty about that. Um, I wouldn't have even accepted money for my top surgery. I would have like taken out a loan and just been in debt for the rest of my life. Uh, but I really didn't need it, uh, immediately because the the guy that I wanted to do my surgery, he, I forget what it was, but basically there was this thing where like we needed a lot of the money up front. Uh, he can't you can't take out a loan on all of it. I needed like six thousand, so we were like, might as well do the twenty four hour fundraiser and like turn it into a, a cool event of some kind. So that's all paid off. Luckily, I still have student loans, but I have been paying my student loans uh, every month. And so that's been good. But yeah, I'll be doing a fundraiser for my bottom surgery. I won't be raising money for my show unless I really have to. I'm trying to shop it around and see if I can just... <laughs> it sucks to say, but I'm probably going to just spend all of my savings on my show because I so badly don't want to fundraise for it because I feel bad asking people for money. Um, and I can't, I, don't, I, I, I can't justify doing it twice. I can't be like... Can you give me money for my show? And also, can you make it so that 
my dick is <laughs> big uh, and makes me feel less bad about myself uh, because one is clearly more important than the other, you know? Uh, so I'm saving up money right now. Uh, LASIK is going to be around 5000 and I'm just going to play it by ear, but I refuse to do two fundraisers unless I absolutely have to. It's gonna be a th it's gonna be a thing. Shaving the base of the shaft is no fun. Yeah, it's like I, I mean, it's going to. What's fun uh, that I didn't expect is I have a, I have a very thick happy trail going, <laughs> the the below the navel, you know, and also above the navel. I'm starting to get, uh, getting some fur, which is dope. It makes me it makes me feel good. Um, but yeah, once I start, it's going to be interesting having my party dig, you know, cause then I will have to shave around that. Uh, but it's one of those things that I have been denied my whole life. So I'm going to be excited about this annoying thing that I have to do because I haven't gotten the chance, uh, to do it. <laughs> Oh, uh, what's the plot of your show? Sorry, I don't know much about it other than uh, that it's in the works. Yeah, I haven't really talked about it much because I don't like to... Uh, I'm so uh, shy talking about my projects until I have something to show. But I guess a short, little abridged, you know, version of um, the beginnings of an elevator pitch. I haven't even formed together an elevator pitch. Basically... This high school senior named Ryan, he starts at a new high school in a new state, and you don't know why he's starting at a new high school in a new state. It's, like, revealed over the course of the show. But um, one of his childhood friends goes missing, and he has to figure out what happened to him, basically. That's, like, a very uh, hodgepodge, I didn't plan this, uh, summer, summary of, of the, the plot but I'm, I'm liking it more and more the more I work on it, which is great because I had plateaued a little bit where I was like, shit, I don't know. I know uh, what has to happen, but I don't know how it happens. So you have puzzle pieces, but then whole chunks of the puzzle were missing. Uh, and then quarantine, instead of what I thought it would do, which is stifle my creativity it's actually fueled it a bit so i've been very inspired lately and i think it's just because for most of my life my fight or flight instinct has always been um flights or like faints or like don't do anything hard uh now i'm on a roll and confidence and excited about shit so quarantine has actually made me very like let's fucking go let's do this which i'm very happy about i hope it keeps going i'm taking breaks when i need to and stuff so when i sub to you on youtube for dark swamp uh, guessing what, uh, guessing what following you would show wouldn't have been possible, but it has been inspirational to see where you've dared going. Just letting you know that. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, it's, um, it's awesome because, like, Dark Swamp was my first, like, passion project. Go write something on your own now that you are a competent writer. Uh, and that was even, that was even before I went to college for writing. And now I'm confident in this project and it's very, it's a very good feeling because um, there's so many projects that I've started writing and started doing concept stuff for and just ditched it because it wasn't my 100%. I was like, I'm not, my, my heart needs to be 100% in a project for me to commit to it. And I'm just not, you know, I'm not confident in the material. But now this one, I'm like, this is, this is some of the best writing that I've done and I'm very excited about that. You know, I want to, I want people to finally see it. I don't have things that I can show people, you know, I'm a writer, but all that's on my writing resume right now is just shit of other people's that I've contributed to. And I want something that is my own and 
you know what, I look young, I might as well play a senior in high school while I can, because who knows, it's, maybe I'll have a beard soon, and I won't be able to do that, so let's do it, legal 18, here we go, uh, so I'm very inspired for that, and we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it, buds, but, uh, yeah, this has been very fun, I'll see you on Sunday, Thank you all so much for the bits and the follows. Uh, this and the and the yeah uh, egg lag. If you're still here, thank you so much for the bits and the sub. Really appreciate it. Um, I'll see y'all in a couple of days. Stay safe. Wash your hands. I love you. All that shit. Um, I'll see you later. Bye, folks.